All right, coaches, we'll make a start. Um, firstly, thanks for joining us. Again, um, it's been great to have um, so many people turn up and some, so many familiar names week to week. Um, very appreciative to Kennedy and Lucas um, for putting out their hand to present uh, in what is our seventh um, instalment uh, and 14th, uh, 13th and 14th clinic overall during this period. Um, starting off, um, just make sure we stay on mute. And then obviously if we have questions, just bump them through to me and I'll ask at the appropriate time. Uh, we're starting off with Lucas Allen, uh, South East Melbourne, NBL assistant coach, uh, director of coaching at Southern Peninsula Sharks, um, men's head coach as well down there, um, long time Victorian uh, country state coach, along with a, a number of other uh, bits and pieces here and there. I won't go on forever, Lucas. Um, about your coaching history, but um, certainly a well-credentialed coach, and he's going to present on creating and maintaining um, advantages on offense. So looking forward to your presentation, coach. Awesome. Thank you. Um, let me get my, get my share screen up. Uh, there we go. Uh, I just want to say, first of all, like, thanks for having me. Like, it's the, I see this is a fairly big privilege with the coaches you've had on board so far. And as you said, it's 13th and 14th. So you've had 12 pretty top-notch clinics. So hopefully everyone gets something out of mine. Um, tonight's about, obviously it's about creating and maintaining an advantage on offense, but it's about, it's not about what to do, but it's simply what I do. So coaches still need to coach, I'm a big believer, you still need to coach your personality and your style. Um, you might take little bits and pieces out of tonight and perhaps you find a heap of things you really don't like from the way we do it, but at least then you do know that and you can put that towards, I guess, your coaching philosophy. Uh, we get started. The, the first part for tonight is why we play the way we do. Uh, and the quote there from Mike McHugh, who's been, a, he's been really good for me. Um, I have a habit of overthinking things, but he helps me simplify it. Uh, and he often speaks about creating broken play and being able to score from it. And that quote about offense doesn't create a score, penetration does. However, offense can help create the penetration. Um, I think that'll sing true throughout much of what I present tonight. The, for those who are uh, well, I'm a self-confessed analytics nerd. Um, the numbers that I've got there are from Synergy and from international basketball. Now, a lot of factors play into them, but they're a large, they're large force behind the way we play, the way we do. So, you know, cuts at 1.19 points per possession, that's the highest points per possession play type there is in, bas in international basketball. Uh, one note I have there, and I've made it small, but the note that you got one, two, three, and five, the fourth highest point per possession play is actually the pick and roll roll man at 1.05, but we don't typically play through a pick and roll roll man. When I say this is an adaptable style or system, it's because it's not A plus B equals C. It's, we've had success, uh, success essentially playing two bigs, no bigs, five guards. Um, it is adaptable with various lineups and rosters. It's unpredictable because it's not structured. We can go into an offensive possession and once we create the advantage, I probably can't tell what's going to happen next. So. It makes it pretty hard for the opposition to be able to work out what's going to happen next as well. Uh, it's non-stop and relentless. Our point of difference in almost any team I coach is we want to win over four quarters. And we speak about owning the full court. So if we own the full court for four quarters, eventually teams wear down. And that's where our advantage kicks in. And then the want to force defense and decision-making situations. So decision-making is tough enough on offense, uh, but it's even tougher on defense particularly not quite sure what's going to happen next. So the more decisions we can, uh, situations we can put defence in, we feel as though our advantages start to generate. Before we move on to some other stuff, uh, just some stats. So the video we're going to show tonight is based off of both our big V season in 2019 and our nationals in 2019. Um, and as you can see there, offensively, they were pretty good. The effective field goal percentage for those who aren't aware essentially takes into account the value of a three-point shot as well as field goal. Uh, the PRP percentage is the percentage of our points from the paint. So although we're generally smaller and faster, we're still having 
you know, 46 or 61 percent of our points in the paint. Offensive rating is how many points you'd score out of 100 possessions if you were to have 100, and PTO is points off turnovers. The one thing I will uh, add to that is the big V 29, and we actually had the fourth best defensive rating as well. Uh, but I won't go into our defensive numbers for nationals last year because they're not very pretty. Uh, some KPIs. Now, I don't want to go into the defensive side of things too much as that's not our focus and Kennedy is presenting on it, but it does drive our offense. So things we're tracking in game and we, we use to monitor how we're playing. So the free point game is we want to win that. So we track our, our free throws, our second chances and our transition points and our opponents. And we want to, we want to come out on top. Kills, which I know Kennedy's going to speak about later, but for us, it kills three stops in a row. We want to get 10 of those in a game. That encourages the consistency on defense. Deflections, we're after 30 plus. Uh, that just measures our constant ball pressure. Kick ahead, so throwing the ball ahead in transition to lane runners, we're after 24 plus a game. That measures our intent in transition. Pre shot stops. So the more we can restrict our, um, our opponent's shot attempts, the better chance we have of winning. The less we get into rebounding battles with our opponents, with the teams I generally coach, the more chance we have of getting, at, getting stops and getting out in transition. So if we can get pre-shot stops, we're after 20 of those a game. That just encourages the way we need to defend. O-rebound difference, we want to have a greater offensive rebound percentage than our opponent. And essentially the shot, so three-point free throw field goal, we want to have more in each of those areas than our opponents as well. And the final one there is a new one. Um, and we're playing around with it in pre-season this year. So I haven't got a chance to get a good solid base of data for it, but we want more than 40% of our opponent's possessions to start with less than 16 seconds. For us, that's a measure of how disruptive our defense is. And as you'll see, our disruption defense and our pre-shot stops leads to our, helps our offense. So what we're trying to achieve, ultimate outcome, great predictable shots. So for everybody, great shots may be different, but um, as much modern basketball is now, it's open threes, layups and free throws. But the thing that I've learned to come to grips with is that if it's a shot that someone practices and they're good at, we'll let them take it. So a prime example is our import last year with our men's program was um, really good in the mid-range. So we allowed him to take mid-range shots that just made him that much harder to guard. So that was a great shot for him. And it was predictable. The predictability of the shot helps us with our D-trans, which plays into some of our offense as well. But the, then we're trying to create an advantage to get those shots, whether it's through a mismatch, defense rotating, and with that it can be either rotating to penetration or closing out to a shooter. A spacing advantage, so a space can be to drive or space to pass. And a numbers advantage, simply having more numbers in the opposition. So how we create the advantage? There's uh, the ball and player movement, which we won't show a uh, specific video on tonight because it ties so much into transition and penetration. Transition, pre-shot stops as we spoke about in our KPIs. That's one way of how we create the advantage in transition. Our first four seconds. So it's a, one of our rules in the first four seconds of the shot clock. We want to kick ahead, change the sides or a screen. Uh, kick aheads, again, we spoke about in our in the KPI stuff. And then we use a lot of pistols. So pistols a bunch of different actions utilising the wing lane runner as well as a trail screener, essentially. Um, but you'll only really see punch screen actions out of that tonight. And then penetration, three types of penetration, we want to use all three. Uh, that's where the advantage is created from in the half court. The pass penetration we refer to is purely passing to it. It can be a low post, it can be a high post, flash, um, any penetration on the dribble or cut, I guess. Then maintaining the advantage. Uh, one of the big things we live by, this is both offensively and defensively and almost everything. Uh, we do is the quote, if you're decisive, you can't be wrong. Uh, what that means is that it doesn't leave other people guessing what you're doing. So even if it's not going to be the right decision, but I'll live with it and I'm decisive, the next person I knows what to do and the person after them knows what to do as well. So we maintain advantage if you're decisive, you can't be wrong. Decision making is huge with it. Um, this vital in everything we do. The quick decisions, the shot, it's a drive, it's a pass. We don't want to be holding onto the ball and waiting. And hit the single, it's a baseball analogy we use a bit. Like we're not after home runs, make the simple play each time down the floor. Uh, playing to our strengths will help us maintain the advantage if everyone plays to their strengths. 
we're going to, the sum of our parts going to uh, help the strength of our whole. And just quick movement. Uh, player movement, in my mind, is arguably more important than ball movement because a player movement allows opportunities for ball movement. All right, some game video on this stuff. So the transition. Um, so first of all, kick ahead, some clips on the kick ahead stuff. Let me turn the mute off, that's fine. So even out of a basket, we still want to be able to Lucas, create opportunities and transition. Lucas, we're still on the PowerPoint. Oh, you're still on the PowerPoint. Lucky you guys, eh? <laughs> um, let me flip this across here then. Yeah, that's better. I was operating off two screens, but there we go. Um, so this first one, so we get the kicker head in transition. Now the kicker itself doesn't necessarily create the advantage, but at the point here, it creates a spacing advantage. Spacing advantage to the baseline and middle. Um, sorry, play this again. And that forces rotations, ends up being uh, more spacing. Play to our strengths by feeding a big, we get a laugh out of it. So the kick head created that. Again, even after a bucket, we're after these after transition opportunities. So the advantage is created through the kick ahead. The advantage we create is spacing and numbers on the weak sides. So we have uh, corner and wing being defended almost by one person. So it's a spacing and numbers advantage. And we maintain it by um, playing to our strengths. Geordie puts the ball straight on the floor and trail three. Again, we create the advantage this time through a uh, kick ahead. The advantage we create is through spacing and rotating defense. So this penetration here, we have two guys to the ball. The spacing advantage we have is with the trail. Kick back, catch and shoot three. The final one, the kick aheads. Again, now we already have the spacing advantage really prior to this kick ahead, but it helps us utilize that advantage. So we kick to the space. And then again, Jordy draws two defenders, which is an advantage. We have rotating defense, the extra passes, and we get a wide open shot again. So the kicker heads are creating the opportunity in transition for us. Uh, some pistol stuff. So again, emphasizing the fact that even after a bucket, we're looking for transition opportunities. So this screen here puts these two defenders into decision-making, which is what we spoke about earlier. We want just defense to be in as many decision-making situations as possible. The advantage we create is the spacing and rotating defense. So we've got space for him to catch. These guys are rotating. Then the quick movement, the action after the action really helps us here. So deal catches and straight away, quick decision, moving the ball, cuts through. Now we get him lifted, but we've got that spacing advantage. But it's that quick decision afterwards, the action after the action really helps drive that. The spacing's not always um, in terms of the spacing on the court. Like this screen here actually creates space between the defender and the ball handler. That creates an advantage for us. So as Dyson gets penetration, the thing I love when looking back at these clips is how often that penetration forces bad vision. You've got one, two, three, four, five defenders all looking at the ball, which creates cutting opportunity, but pressure wasn't to catch that. We've got shooter, shooter as well. We've got three real targets to score out of that. Right, so again, the action that creates advantage is this punch screen out of our pistol. Uh, the advantage it creates is the rotating defense now. The guy setting the screen was the best shooter in the competition, so they're clearly not leaving him. That gives us a spacing advantage. Now, rotating defense, we play to our strengths, cut to the basket, that's how we maintain it. Uh, this one just goes a little bit further into the pistol stuff. So again, we create the advantage with the screen. The driving lane is somewhat taken away, so we get the ball movement. Now, this defender down here is defending our best shooter, but because we've forced those rotations, we have the advantage and we maintain it through that quick ball movement. Uh, some pre-shot stops. All of these uh, create a numbers advantage. So that pre-shot stop 
once that ball's back in play, it's now one, two, three versus two. When we have that, we have the advantage. It is play to our strengths. An almost, an almost identical situation from the same game. A pre-shot stop, kick ahead. Now that risk on the ball there now creates a numbers advantage. One, two, three versus two defenders. We maintain that with Charlie being aggressive on the ring. That's his strength. We maintain the advantage. We don't get the stop out of the initial coverage on this, but this is where deflections really matter. So as the ball rotates, Paddy gets a deflection here, which generates the pre-shot stop. Now in transition, Charlie does a great job changing sides of the floor, which creates a numbers advantage on the other side. It's two of us versus one of them. Extra pass. And again, a great predictable shot. This one I love because that, this is our big man that triggers the break. So as we rewind this, and I want you to watch uh, our two high guys as well as this play here is how quickly they get out of the blocks. The so five man gets the stop, creates transition, and now it becomes 4v1. Like any team should be scoring out of that opportunity. On the final one with the transition stuff, we spoke about first four seconds we want a uh, kick ahead, change of sides, or a screen. So here's a change of size example. So right here, all five defenders are essentially four and a half defenders in the paint. So by changing sides, it forces rotating defense. That's our advantage. Playing to our strengths, Geordie getting the paint, and then ball movement. That maintains it's a kick out, two extra passes, and a great predictable shot. This time again, we have a spacing advantage already, but the change of size allows us to use it. So Dill has all this space here to use, but by changing size of the floor, it allows us to use it. The thing I love about this, and so one term is we refer to a bit as if we compact, that's fine, providing we then expand. So Dill makes this pass and it's fairly compact, but then if you watch him, he sprints back out. So nothing's on for Austin, kick out. Maintain the advantage through ball movement and play movement, and Dill ends up getting a shot again. And that there becomes into our offensive rebound percentage battle we spoke about. Uh, as Mel Downer presented on recently, we tag up, uh, helps us create extra opportunities to score. And that's a byproduct of that. And the last one on the transition stuff, the change of size can be through the dribble as well. So as you'll see here, Charlie does a great job. You can't see it at three quarter speed, but at full pace, he does a great job changing sides and it creates all this space. So that's our advantage, space. Maybe slightly legal screen, but we get away with it. Now, now we have an advantage with two guys coming into the ball. So it's rotating defense. And from the corner, Dylan makes a great read, great timing to cut. We get a laugh out of it. So from those, you can see with the, the four different ways we've created the advantage, the kicker heads, our pistol, um, our pre-shot stops and change of sides and how we've maintained those. I'll now go into some, uh, some more of our half court stuff. This, this will show more of us spending longer with maintaining the advantage, I guess. Oops, sorry. I had this all set up for a different screen. Here we go. All right, so off the dribble. So this advantage create with the screen, but the dribble penetration. So at this point with this defender taken out, all this space is an advantage and these two defenders now in decision-making mode, what they're gonna do. Paddy from the corner does a great job getting lower than his guy, cut and lay up. Now the thing out of this too, if Paddy's not open, Keith's done a great job lifting, we also have a throw back three. Right, so the advantage is created through dribble penetration. Uh, sorry, the action creates advantage through dribble penetration. We get the spacing. Then the quick movement on the cut. So you watch Keith here from um, this wing. As Christian turns, defender turns his head, cut, and one. 
But that's not an ideal cutting situation, hence, uh, sorry, not hence, not an ideal cutting situation, the big there, but because it's decisive, everyone's on the same page. We almost don't have time to get in each other's way because of it. Dual penetration forces one, two, three defenders to step towards the ball. Kyle reads that there's a great gap there to cut into. He's playing to his advantage. So he's not going to score against bigger bodies, but we've got a wide open corner three. So it takes his time, moves the ball with the extra pass. Shot. Uh, so we still don't actually have an advantage. So I don't consider that dribble there by Paddy an advantage, but by moving the ball, Dyson creates advantage here off the dribble. Now, again, the reason I've kept this clip in here is because it does have poor spacing at, uh, in, at one stage. So here we've got four guys inside the paint, well, three and a half guys inside the paint. But again, if we compact, that's fine, providing we expand. And the quick ball movement and the decisiveness allows that. Kick out, extra pass, and three. Right, last one with the crowd advantage off the dribble. One thing which we'll speak about later is if we pass, we want to cut a screen. So you can see here, as soon as Austin makes this pass, he cuts hard through. Now the spacing advantage is now behind the three point line. So we engage five defenders in the key, our spacing advantage is behind the three. Now I'm just gonna let this play, but we maintain the advantage through Quick decisions, uh, we're playing to our strengths, we have extra passes, we have cuts. And then we have a bunch of guys tagging up, creating second chances. Nothing's forced, playing to our strengths again, kick out. If you notice there, we'll compact it, but again, we expanded. Ball movement. Eventually becomes a foul. We don't get a score out of it, but it's not about the outcome for this. It's more about the way we're playing. And if I'm a coach coaching against that, three offensive rebounds on a foul, pull me hair out. All right, some pass penetration stuff. So although we don't typically, like I said at the start, we don't play through our role man much, but we do play through the pass penetration because it still creates an advantage for us. So this pass penetration creates an advantage because it gives us space to play with. This screening action here creates an advantage on the weak side because there's decisions that have to be made. There's a split action ball side. Again, decisions have to be made. Uh, we get rotating defense out of it. And it's action after the action. So once Cade screens, he doesn't just stand there. He actually cuts basket, which isn't a prescribed read. That's just what he's, he, did, he did at that time. We get a laugh out of it. Now the advantage with this one is created through a screen, but it's the pass penetration after it that helps maintain it. It's the advantage created of the screen, two guys to the ball. The pass penetration to the short roll uh, helps maintain it, but then we have the numbers advantage. It's one defender really to two guys, play our strengths, make the extra pass, easy bucket. This one I love. So, you see here on the weak side, there's a low post action. And if you watch the defender right here, that's guarding the ball, he'll go trap it. All right. Great read by Kyle. His defender's traps where he's cut, but that's now engaged the next line of defense. Engaged him, and that's left the second best shooter on our team wide open for a catch and shoot. Out from the side, like we're taking that every single time we get it. Some pass penetration to the high post this time. And the area where I believe this creates advantage is the spacing because of how much of the action's off the ball. So this flare screen and this wide, wide pin down creates a lot of space near the basket. Again, it puts defense in decision making. So the quick action after the action, understanding where to get the ball to our teammates' strengths, bucket. A different uh, pass penetration this time. Low post, we get a dribble out. And the advantage this then creates is we get a, a mismatch. So you get the big guy defending our guard. We have the quick movement leading up to it. We get a laugh out of it. All right, now some of my little babies with the cutting creating the advantage. So this cut's a bit different. So Darcy down here is actually meant to set a back pick like a Spanish action. 
but the cut that Fraser creates down the gap engages two defenders. So just for that split second in time, it engages them. So now we have the advantage. The thing I'd like us to notice too, again, pass and cut, pass and screen, is that Dan here, as soon as he releases it, he goes to set a screen. As soon as that ball's reversed, Tom starts to drift to create space. So all this advantage started with that cut from Fraser to the block. Good movement. And again, you'll notice the weak side, they're moving, engaging defense. Spacing, cutting lanes, flat. That all that started with just that initial advantage of the cut. All right. Tonga's cut here, so extra pass and cut, actually engages this defender, number three. And what that means is it creates a whole lot of space behind the three-point line for us. So cut, engage the defense, and Geordie wraps the whole way around, which we'll talk about a bit later. Wraps the whole way around, kick back. you notice by the time he shoots it, although he got really compact, we're almost expanded perfectly again. We've got deal lifting. Paddy should be getting out a little bit quicker. Tonga's low, ready to rebound. We've almost got good spacing again. Uh, this one here, another really good example of our spacing becoming compact. Like four guys in a quarter of the court, it's not good spacing, but we're decisive out of it. Geordie realizes, gets out of that hard cut, Dylan hard cut, Christian's decisive on the catch. Defense is still worrying about defending their cutters, and a layup occurs. Now, two of my favorite clips. This cut by Geordie and this cut by Austin is what creates a spacing advantage as well as a rotating defense. Change the sides, now just rotate back. One of the rules which we'll speak about later we have is we don't want a three-man weak side. We always want to have uh, essentially corners, wings, and the other guys penetrating or cutting. Dylan here, as soon as this ball's reversed, cuts hard through to create space. He's out of there. If he had to stay, we'd have had four guys on one side. So he cuts through. Quick movement, pick and roll, layup. Now, if we watch this one back and watch Geordie from the start, he doesn't stop. Right? That makes it really tough to defend. So Geordie's here at the top. Pass and cut. And by the time that ball gets around, his defense still hasn't got position. Ends up being a layup out of it. So we maintain that advantage through ball and player movement. All right, last one, and this one we might play a couple of times because it's my all-time favourite with this stuff. Purely through the amount of different actions we have. Dylan being so high and wide allows the ball movement out of this. Right, and his pass and cut creates advantage. Pass, and that cut creates advantage. It gives us just that bit of space, even though Tonga's there. gives us that space to penetrate. Now, the initial pass and cut receives it. Dylan receives it. Extra pass and movement. Quick ball movement. Pass, cut, and that becomes a layup again. So I'll play that one through again, full speed without, uh, not full speed, three quarter pace without stopping it for you. Advantage is created through the pass and cut. I still don't think that's actually an advantage. Here it's created. Spacing and rotating defense. We maintain it through playing to our strengths and quick movement, action after the action, extra passes, cuts and screens. None of this is designed offense. This is all them learning to play the game. All right, so back to the PowerPoint. All right, so some rules within that. Like we, have, we have really limited rules. Um, it's about guiding the players to what we want. Uh, it's to assist their decision-making. Well, that's, well, that's what the rules are there for. So you pass and cut or you screen. We don't stand still as you saw in some of those clips. As I spoke about the first four seconds is kick ahead, change aside or screen. Um, always continue cut. So what that means is if you go to cut, don't stop. That ties into if you're decisive, you can't be wrong. You cut you're the whole way through and everyone else can respond. We don't want a three-man weak side because I think that's too easy to defend. Like-for-like -like ball screens aren't allowed. Unless it's a punch screen, they're not allowed. They just don't create an advantage. And the space we want is corners, wings, and seams or pro lanes. But they can kind of live by those rules. They'll help drive that, their decision-making. 
and how we get to a lot of this stuff. Uh, it's how we train. So again, it's about building instincts slash habits so that decisions require minimal thought. Uh, I recently finished a book called The Power of Habit. Within that book, it spoke about 40% of our decisions made daily are unconscious habitual decisions. They're not decisions we actually think about. And that's what we want our players to do on the basketball court. We don't want to have to think, they habitually do it. So at practice, um, teach reads and plays. So playing 2v1, 3v2, 4v3, et cetera, and the advantage, disadvantage, small sided games. Um, we'll go through our slides, uh, reads in the next slides, but it's not about the right cut at the right time. It's about all about doing things perfectly. It's about being able to play the game. The, to assist the habit of the continuous ball movement, we often put in place different scoring systems to emphasize what we want. So for example, it might be if you score without a dribble, you get double points. Or if you score off a certain cut, you get extra points. Or if you score off an offensive rebound, put back the extra points. That emphasizes what we're after with this. Uh, we practice playing in the full court. Now, again, we want to own the full court, but for teams that don't have that luxury, I suggest, and this comes from uh, some advice Jared Hilly gave me, is practice playing to the half court then. Get the ball out of the net, play to the half, come back and attack. So you get some sort of next play mentality into it. Uh, mass participation, we do everything possible with as many people as possible at once. Um, you don't often get better on the sidelines, so you're better off being on the floor doing something. And nothing replaces hard work. Well, as cliche as that may sound, uh, for not so much for the national skills, but for the big V guys, most of them do two to three sessions a week on top of our team sessions. And in our team sessions, they're nonstop. They really get drink breaks. When they are out of drills, that's the opportunity to get them. Um, so again, it's just that, that hard work is what drives it. All right, so some of the cuts we teach, and we won't go through a whole lot of detail, and all of these are used as shooting drills, small-sided games, advantage, disadvantage. So, for example, this might be a, a 2v1 situation. We'll show some training footage of uh, in a tick. But the real basic principle. Now, these guys start seam and wing. We don't want to start in corner and on the wing. The easiest thing for the eye to see, apart from light, is movement. So if we just stand there, it's hard to see. But if we're moving to those spots, we're more likely to be seen. So one penetration, we shift. And the simplest kick out extra pass. I'll just flip kick extra. But then comes in what's next. So what's next, whoop, too quick. But what's next is the kick out, extra pass and cut. Then you can feed the cut. All right, kick out and the extra pass is taken away because uh, they're getting used to denying that. So back guy, if you're not open, cut. If they cut and you don't have anything, they've got a vacuum to drive into. So we refer to those as our, uh, our kick out reads. I'll share this presentation, everybody, at the end. So if you want to copy those down by all means, but I'll share it afterwards as well. Uh, now refer to our cut reads. So off the weak side, so when we're penetrating, generally, we'd like the opposite to cut. So if we're penetrating high, we'd like low to cut. But it's not always going to work. Like, we let the players organically grow this themselves. Penetrate low, we'd like high to cut. Now, if we penetrate and we get a cutter through, for example, the three cuts through on this, and we kick it out, we'll fill the empty spot, now have an extra pass opportunity again. And I guess it becomes the same as our kick out reads from there. We spoke about not wanting the three man weak side. So there's really two ways we, we prevent that. The first way on, is on penetration, we get the high guy to wrap around. That means we've only got the four and the three on the weak side, the two's wrapped around. The five may be a post that's circling or maybe in this corner. It's up to you guys. The other opportunity is the is a cut. So we drive high with a low cut, drive low with a wing cut. And I have no dramas at all when we're doing this. If we get the wrap and the cut, we have movement. We know everyone's going to be. We're decisive. We can live with that. Um, now some training video just real quick. So. These guys did this um, as part of some clinic stuff we did at the start of our representative season. So these, these athletes probably only had, for some of them was the first session seeing it, and some of them have been at that club for about two weeks. So they're doing a respectable job because of that. 
So just get the pass and cut to start the drill. But Billy here's going to have to play defense on two guys on the weak side. So once we kick out, that play is done. But now it just starts during our kick out reads. So again, just an advantage, disadvantage drill. Drive against Steve's trying to defend two. They should lose each time. Like this is a, these are quick drills. We'll just smash through to try to get some repetitions. Now we're going 2v1 plus a trail defender. So Pat here's going to be a trail defender. First guy's kick out. Pat will have the second pass, but we continue to play from there. Again, just encourage the athletes to make their own reads and own decisions on this. But then build us in three on three. Live on the same principles, just starting to get a bit more game like with it. And some 4v3 with the 4v3 stuff, and it's same with the other, the 2v2 stuff as well. We just don't defend the ball twice in a row. So that forces defense to rotate, um, helps us maintain our advantage offensively, but also helps us defensively. So we have the advantage. So if we have the advantage, we should always be getting scores or great shots that are predictable. Now, we'll say we did a lot of this stuff on zero to start with as well. So they haven't just gone straight to 4v3. The last thing is just some 4v4. Now we start the 4v4 purely with some pass and cut actions. Pass, cut, spacing, quick decisions, maintaining that advantage. And then we just build in some pass and screen or cut. So Billy here makes the pass, then he screens away. Pass down and cut. Just straight away has defense engaged, keeps our advantage or creates the advantage and keeps it. So that, that's, that's essentially how we teach it. Um, now again, going back to our, our scoring stuff, you can score at different ways to emphasize different things. Well, yeah, the keys to this style. Um, we're teaching them how to play, uh, allow them to organically grow up within themselves uh, with guidance. They'll find what suits them best. So, you know, Particular players might find they want to cut every single time. That's okay. The other guys will get used to that. You might have some knockdown shooters who never want to cut. That's all right. The other guys will get used to that. But if you've got a, a legitimate shooter, you probably don't want them cutting. Uh, let the players play. It's a, it's a player's game. It's about the players. Let them do what they do best. Within this, it lets them do what they do best. Be decisive. Be decisive. You can't be wrong. Uh, live with the mistakes. Use them as learning opportunities. So coach the decisions. Live with the mistakes as long as they make change when coached on it, though. We're not just going to live with the mistake if they continuously make it. With that, coach the correct decisions, too. Um, some of those clips didn't have the outcome we wanted in terms of a made bucket, but they were great shots and predictable. So we coach those decisions and that builds confidence in it. Um, and allow for input. It just comes back to being a player's game. If they feel one way works uh, better for them, allow them to experiment with that. Uh, prime problem with that is screening stuff. So when you're having 2v2 screening plus a passer, let the players play. They'll organically build it and grow it themselves. Uh, the less rules we have in place, the, the more freedom they have to play, the more they're going to be able to make those reads on how to, what advantage is there and how to maximise it. Uh, but that's all I've got for, for that stuff on the creating and maintaining advantage on offence. Thanks um, for that, Lucas. That was awesome, mate. Um, no worries. Absolutely love the presentation and the um, some of your terminology and the simplicity of a lot of it. Um, and also, often, you know, just how much you emphasise the cut. There seems to be uh, a bit of a lost art. Um, yeah. You know, with the spacing and things we do these days, often these players sometimes just space and stand. And um, how you've built that in is is really good. I think the coaches can take a lot out of that. I, I certainly know I will. So um, you did cover off on some of the questions that were coming through um, throughout because of the stuff you touched on at the end. But I still might ask a couple just so we can unpack it a little bit more. But the first one is, 
Um, what do you see yourself valuing more as a coach? Is it because um, you made the reference to the Nationals that the defensive stats weren't as good? Uh, are you an offensive coach, defensive coach? And then what do you sort of see the balance just for coaches more generally? Do you have to sort of go one way or the other? Um, the last question, I don't think you initially have to go one way or the other. Like a, a big part of the way we play is, as we said, is the pre-shot stops and that generates our offense. And you know, we had a line in there of the pre-shot stops helping generate that. Um, I think it was the transition is the second highest points per possession shot in international basketball. So we definitely value the defense, but I guess more in that pressured up the court, on the full court style, not so much in the sit down, guard your yard in the half court. Um, so I'm far more of an offensive coach. And I guess we get away with teaching less defense by having far more, I guess, junk stuff that we use in the full court. Sure. No, that's good. Um, just one that I haven't written down if this came straight through, but it's a good one. Um, there seemed to be a fair bit of um, repenetration uh, on yeah. a lot of the, the stuff. Um, how prescriptive are you on that redrive on the first kick out? Because sort of the trend over the last, um, you know, maybe five years ago was you, you sort of never redrive on that first kick out. It was always extra pass or shot. What's sort of your philosophy? Yeah, that, I think it really comes back to, again, teaching and practice. So we don't say don't read penetrate on the first kick out. Um, within drills, especially the younger athletes, we may say we want them to throw the extra pass. If they read penetrate and it turns out to be a bad decision, we just speak to them, we coach them about it. So we coach the decision. So what did you see when you went to penetrate then? Or um, if it turned out to be a good one, again, we might stop that and say, what did you see? Oh, I saw a big gap. Great, take it. So it comes back to us not wanting to be so prescriptive in what we do. It's about we created an advantage, take it. Now, we don't want to, as I said, we don't want to repenetrate penetrate if there is no advantage, but yeah, yeah, yeah. if there's an advantage, take it, go drive. Awesome. No, that's great. Um, how much um, freedom do sort of the players have to screen on and off the ball? Are all players given the same amount of freedom um, to, to sort of sit uh, on ball or off ball screens? I mean, I know you referenced you don't want guards setting just traditional guard to guard screens. Thank God, because I hate that. Um, <laughs> and uh, but yeah, how much freedom do those players have in those um, screening situations? Yes, yeah, so off the ball, they have essentially ultimate freedom. Like if they don't cut because if they pass and don't cut because they either feel as though it's not going to create an advantage or it's not the right timing to cut and they decide to screen well they have the advantage on how they're going to do that yep. and that could be wide pin down punch down like a corner pin down it can be a flare that's up to them we teach all of those we do a lot of work two on two three on three that stuff in terms of on ball um again they have freedom to send an on ball when they like again we don't have a guard for guard but one area we try to keep away from is wing. Like we don't set very many wing on balls at all. Um, we'd much prefer it to be a middle on ball because you're going to feel as though that creates more of an advantage for us, and it allows us more pace. Coach, is that your pacing? Um, you, you sort of stay away from the side ball screen because you think the middle ball screen is better spacing, or is that yeah. what's sort of the theory there? Yeah, more just the better spacing and opportunities to play out of it. Yeah, cool. Um, what are the post reads within the offense? Yep. So. Um, we go pass our screens high guy and weak side low sets a flare screen. So both sides of the floor have a screening action involved. Um, and then we also have the, the wheel action. So I'll go back to um, presentation real quick because it goes through some of it. Yep. So you've got that screen now? Yep. Yeah, we've got that. Yeah, so this one here, this is, I guess, the base layer of what we do. But on this pass penetration now, I know Brady's in the pin down, but that, that's because we have our best shooter in the corner. So that can be a flare screen and pass the screens high. We play out of that. Yep. Um, and then what I spoke about, term, we call it wheel. Um, some others refer to it as a dribble out. Is when the ball's thrown into the post, we actually get the post player to dribble. We, we say dribble hard north. Hard north allows the guy to get downhill off the bounce. It actually generally creates a lot of room to roll into. This clip, it doesn't. But by having the action high, it generates a lot of room to cut into generally. Awesome. Awesome, mate. Um, that's great. That's great. Um, you, you mentioned you don't like to throw the ball to the, or play through the roll man much. Can you just unpack that a little bit for the coaches of what's your theory there? Uh, it's not so much we don't like to. It's just that we typically don't have a typical strength. Um, yeah. 
So in a few of those clips you saw that we played off of, well, there was one clip in particular, we played off a short roll and we then fed someone in the dunker spot. Um, a deep roll is almost non-existent the way we play, just I guess because it gets in the way maybe of the other stuff we do. Uh, the short roll definitely, like if we're playing a middle pick and roll, we'd much rather a short roll allows us to then read the situation and play from there. But I feel as though the role itself generally engages defence, which is an advantage. Find the open guys, then we can penetrate again. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, probably last one, mate. Yep. Um, do you know, a lot of that was more motion principles, obviously, and just basic principles of play. But do you happen to run, you know, a lot of set actions, or is it predominantly those quick actions and then playing out of those concepts? What's the yeah. balance? So we have some we have some sets and they're they're generally more families of place and they're they're generally pretty quick. So the idea behind it is to get some quick penetration and as Mike as I alluded to at the start, Mike McHugh speaks a bit about create the broken play and then play with it. Yep. Um, or the offense can create penetration. So sometimes our offense helps create penetration, but a lot of the time we get that early pass and cut, early pass and screen that does most of the work for us and we can then live with it from there. For sure, for sure. Well, um, th there's nothing else that sort of popped up that I don't think you've covered off on already because it was such a detailed presentation. So thank you uh, so much for that. And I'm certainly going to watch that back and um, pick some things up. I think there's some great stuff in there for coaches at junior level and we'll certainly take some back to club land, mate. So might be the, um, the Wyndham Sharks often. <laughs> you don't have a mascot yet, so there you go. We can share it. My okay. pleasure. Um, as I said, I'm happy to I can send that presentation through to you maybe reason and it can be shared out and yep. yeah, I'm happy to email that out as part of the um or just put a drop box link up or whatever yep. and um, get that out to the coaches. We're sure. happy. Looking forward to see how Kennedy stops all that. Awesome. <laughs> um thanks. Now I'll introduce uh obviously someone that's presented for us before. Um, he was so popular, I kept having people ask, can we get him back? And uh, he's more than happy to help us out again. And that's um, Kennedy Karima, uh, New Zealand, former New Zealand Tall Ferns uh, head coach, um, Sunbury coaching director, NBL1 head coach at Knox, former WNBL coach. Um, his resume uh, is long, um, but he's um, certainly uh, a great guy. He helps us out. Uh, a lot, and when I say us, I mean just coaches in general. He's always generous with his time and happy to share. And I'm very happy that he's he's jumped on with his defensive um, presentation um, today. I think it's going to be um, great, and the coaches will get heaps and heaps out of it. Excellent, uh, Reese. Thanks for having me again, and uh, and coaches really appreciate you tuning in. Um, Lucas, appreciate the uh, the presentation also, mate. Really informative and. Um, and professional for the presentation, mate. So really appreciate you giving up your time as well. So learned a great deal myself from that, uh, that presentation, I guess, for us coaches. Uh, you know, I'm hoping we're all well and have been doing a... I'm sure we've all been doing a really good job of uh, practising our social distancing um, during this time. Um, my presentation today is on building a defensive-minded team or programme. Uh, you know, the goal for me is is to hopefully give you some insight in understanding that defense is more than just having a, a set of drills that are going to, uh, that you're going to use to condition your team to play defense. There are so many other factors to building a defensive program. Um, and my hope is that I can at least show you some of the building blocks that I've used in the, uh, in the past uh, with some of the teams um, I've worked with and you know, I, I guess it's it's probably fair to say that to get to this point, um, it's taken me a lot of time to build this. A lot of nothing here's authentic. I've stolen it all from everybody else and adapted it for my own liking. Um, you know, and if you're a great coach, you have to be a pretty good thief. So you steal a lot of stuff. And, you know, this is some of the stuff that I've uh, come up with. So, look, hopefully it's of some benefit to you and that it gives you a chance to maybe consider and think about the, the stepping stones or the things you would like to implement into your program and implement with your, your teams. I think the worst thing that could possibly happen is that we come out of this and, and, and you know, a handful of coaches are doing exactly the same thing because I just think you can be a better coach. So uh, please, as, as, as much as you can, you know, utilize it, use it, but uh, really think hard about how you can adapt it for yourself. So hopefully that screen's coming, it's going to come across okay. 
for everybody here. So I think you've, you've got a bit of a wrap as, as to what I've done before coaching wise. So I won't go through too much of the, um, the context of, of the presentation. Um, but in terms of who I've coached, um, as, as Reese has pointed out throughout the, um, and during the introduction, I've currently the, the coaching director at, at Sunbury Basketball. Um, and that that came about post coaching WNBL, and been fortunate enough to work with a number of teams through the state programs um, at state state level, and obviously with the state metro and the sixteen girls over the last couple, and also WNBL and the national team to try and develop some of the stuff and, and mould it. And I guess some of the real challenges with with a lot of the the teams I have coached in the past, particularly the New Zealand team, was and you know I know Guy is battling with this now. It's extremely difficult because we'd be lucky to get a couple of days, maybe a week together if we're really lucky. Um, and the build-up, whereas, you know, State League, um, goodness, working with those players, you know, f- from as early as November or October all the way through to the end of, uh, you know, July, August, sometimes the, the, you know, the first week of September. So you're spending a lot of time with those teams. And I guess when you get to spend a lot of time with those teams, uh, you get to develop and adapt um, and evolve a lot of your defensive philosophy because you spend such a long period of time with those players. So I guess it's no different to anyone here who would be a domestic coach or a VJBL coach. You do spend a lot of time with these uh, these young athletes and even with the state program in some senses. I mean, I got to spend more time with them and coach them, you know, through a lot of this stuff. Um, in a lot of detail, whereas with the national team, you've really got to, prioritize what you can teach in a short space of time so for me defense certainly given the programs i've worked with a lot of a lot of success um but as i think i mentioned before i had to lose a lot of games there are a lot of uh a lot of crap sandwiches i had to eat to get to the point where you know i really had to be critical about what i was doing and how we were doing it and you know, a lot of, you know, obviously the analytics in the game have really helped change a lot of things now to give you some, 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 a better understanding as to how you are going to implement a, a you know, a defense or an offense. Um, but the formula that I've sort of come up with or that I work with has given the teams, you know, particularly the Sunbury uh, State League team, a lot of success. Um, out of the four seasons that I coached there, we were the best defensive team. Uh, two out of the four times, and we were second only by 0.03 uh, for two of the other uh, seasons there. And then as a byproduct, we've also been one of the best defensive teams, best of, uh, sorry, best offensive team, I believe, two or three out of the four. Um, I'm not going to go through all the statistics here, but um, you know, generally speaking, we're holding teams to around the 60 point per game margin. And I can show you some some numbers that I've crunched throughout the last four years. Um, throughout the presentation. So give you some understanding that, you know, have coached a little bit and even with the New Zealand team to some extent, obviously have had some success, just not as consistent. And then, you know, obviously coaching the under 16 Metro team. I mean, was fortunate enough last year to have an incredibly talented team and would have been much the same this year, but obviously your nationals are still to be determined as to what's happening with that. So um, I'll carry on with that next part of the uh, presentation. So these are the steps um, to, to building a defensive-minded team or program. Um, and I'll cover each of these steps as, as I go. Um, well, the first thing you need to do is you need to create season-by-season or game-by-game targets and objectives, um, which I'll cover off. Um, so, you know, they could be something. Objectives, for example, uh, you want to hold the team at certain teams to a certain percentage. It might be a number of deflections, which Lucas covered, which I also covered. Kills, which Lucas also covered, which I'll cover in hopefully a little more detail for coaches so you have a better understanding of that. Uh, second thing you need to obviously have, or I believe you need to have, is a defensive system philosophy that is clear and that your players understand. Um, whether you you know whether you're talking about your push points, uh, how you close out, how you defend pick and rolls, how you defend off ball screen actions, your defensive transition rules. You know, obviously the the tagging up has been a, a really popular um, change that I've seen in the last sort of three to five years. Um, 
you know, or perhaps you're, you're a team that sends a certain amount to the offensive glass and a certain amount back. Um, so you need to have a really clear defensive system and philosophy that's, that, that's easy for your players to understand. Uh, dedicating time to your training sessions. This is a big one. Um, a lot of coaches out there, we, we call ourselves defensive coaches. And we say we're a defensive team or we're the best defensive team. And, you know, yet we're not, are we really dedicating the, the required amount of time um, to our training sessions to condition and work on our skills, our technique, and obviously mindset. And when I speak about a defensive minded team and I say it's more than drills, it's also about creating a mindset to play defense. Um, that becomes really important. So I'll cover that off as well. Uh, creating a culture that rewards and highlights effort on the defensive end and celebrating defensive achievements. Um, I'll cover that off. Obviously, giving your players and leaders ownership of your defense. Uh, that's a really, really important one. And, you know, as much as, you know, I can put all the rules in place, but my players are the players that actually have to go on the floor and play it. Um, so having the right people in your program that can help drive that and coach it um, is, is incredibly important. Uh, having a system of accountability to keep your players accountable um, within your defensive rules and structure is a big part of it as well, which I'll cover off. Uh, scouting and knowing your opposition, I'll cover a small amount of scout. Um, I won't get into too much detail with that, but of course, if there are questions afterwards, I'm always happy to elaborate on any of the stuff that I cover today. And... You know, the last part, I think, is you constantly need to review your defensive objectives throughout your season and just review your defense in general, whether that be through video, um, statistical analysis. It's so important that, uh, you know, you, you've got to be accountable to your own objectives or your own standards and expectations. So going through that process is incredibly important. So I'll cover off how um, I do that also. So... So first one I, I mentioned in the, the slide was game-by-game game objectives. Um, this, this is how we measure the success of our defence. So certainly with the New Zealand national team to the point where obviously I, I stepped away from the program to, to the teams I coach now, um, state league or state team. Um, I use this, this formula here, um, which, which I think has been a you know, what certainly has worked well for, for myself. Um, so the first one we do is we, we measure kills per game. So uh, coaches, just so we understand what kills actually are, is it's when we get three consecutive stops, defensive stops in a row without getting scored on, um, without fouling and without giving up an offensive rebound. So if we do that three times, we count that as one kill. And then obviously, once you've got one kill, it resets back to zero automatically and you continue to do that. So at state league level, we aim for eight. Um, at WNBL level, um, just from my experience, eight is a pretty tough number to get to. Um, most teams are somewhere between the six to seven vicinity. Uh, at state league level, I think eight's pretty, pretty achievable and certainly has been for uh, the teams I've been coaching in the past. So... Kills, why would we use them and why are they important? Well, they create momentum through us through defensive stops. Um, that's what we want. We want to generate as many easy, uncontested, fast break laps we possibly can, and they're best generated through getting defensive stops. So kills are really important for us. Um, and, and again, you know, I think it can be really demoralising for the opposition team uh, if they can't score on you that amount of times. And, you know, again, we've... we've uh, I wish I had some. I've got a video example I'll show you a little later on in the presentation, uh, but I don't have too much video on this, uh, this presentation at all. Hustle plays. Um, for us, it's five per quarter. Um, and hustle plays for us, they're measured by uh, shot clock violations, deflections, steals, loose ball gets, charges. Um, some of those things can obviously be stated through the stats. Some of those things, um, you know, you're required, well, your assistant coaches are required to, to, to keep track of those throughout the game. Um, obviously, some of them are started through turnovers, but not specifically in those categories that I've covered. Um, again, so hustle plays are important for, for me. Generally speaking, we average close to seven, you know, and in some games, really good games, anywhere upwards of 12 plus. So um, five is a pretty low uh, baseline, but still, if you're getting 20 hustle plays a game, I, I don't know any coach in the world that's going to complain of 20 hustle plays. It's generally a pretty good starting point. Uh, 15 points or less, um, again, you're, 
different levels. I mean, of course, an NBA coach couldn't come up with 15 points or less a game. It would be, uh, for one, they'd have no one watching their games. And for two, I think it'd be pretty boring basketball. But, uh, you know, for state league level, I think it's great. Uh, state team level, VJBL level, I think, you know, generally speaking, you, you can keep a team easily under 15 points or less. Um, and again, you know, you're trying to limit the amount of possessions and, and scores they can possibly get per game. Another big one we track is keeping teams to 40% or less from the field. Um, we don't, I don't, I mean, I track effective field goal percentage, but in terms of, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot easier because effective field goal percentages aren't delivered to you in paper uh, throughout the game, although it's a pretty easy mathematic, which I can talk to you all about later on if you wanted to do it for yourself. Well, there's a lot of websites that can do it for you. Um, but we want to keep teams to 40% or less. And, and for us, if we know teams are shooting the ball under 40%, uh, we generally know we're forcing them to pretty tough, difficult, contested shots. Um, if the shot percentage is low, or they could be having a really incredibly bad game, um, which obviously happens too, you know, and I'm talking about defensive luck versus defensive execution. There's a difference between the two of those a little later on. Um, but for us, again, a, a benchmark of how well we play defense is whether we keep teams under 40%. And the last one, if we want to keep teams under 10 offensive rebounds per game, much for the same reason I spoke before about limiting teams' second chance shots, limiting teams' uh, possessions per game. We want to have as many possessions as we possibly can. And, uh, I mean, obviously, never got to play or well, coach a game with the NBL 1 this year. I'd love to, but uh, with the Knox team I was coaching this year, we're going to be coaching this year, for example... Um, you know, we had some pretty talented players that were joining the program and you know, the way I pitched defense the team was we were going to have a lot of hungry mouths to feed and by feeding players, I meant on the offensive end, you know, there's a lot of balls we want to, we need to shoot and we obviously need to distribute the ball amongst a lot of players to keep everybody happy and well, the best format, well, the best way of doing that was, you know, ensuring that the other team down the other end of the floor didn't get as many shots as perhaps I would have liked to. So we maximise as many positions as we possibly could. So we spoke about feeding the family and making sure that we get as many stops as we possibly can. But one way of doing that is ensuring that teams only get one shot. Um, again, per offensive position. Although, you know, to keep a team to zero offensive rebounds would be close to impossible. So even at international level, 10 has been a pretty good number to go by in the past. Okay, so uh, defense for me, I know Shannon presented on this, uh, you know, five or maybe six uh, sessions ago on, on defensive phases. So, you know, obviously offensively these days, the uh, pace, poise, and penetrate um, sectioned offense, you know, in terms of cutting your shot clock up is, is pretty popular. Why well, use the same for defense? And so for me, defense is, is cut into three phases. And defense in a nutshell, if, if you were to think of it as, you know, if you had to simplify it or, you know, create one sentence that, you know, would give players an understanding of the importance of it. And for me, I think the best defensive teams are prepared, you know. And what I mean by that is, and I'll go through phase one shortly, is, well, the team that's prepared before the other team is going to give themselves the best chance of competing. Um, so in phase one, for example, for me, is as, as my teams are in the act of shooting the ball, um, we begin to move to floor spots. So again, if you're a tag up team, obviously you're tagging up to the inside shoulder of your player. But for me, um, I like to send three to the offensive glass with one long rebounder and one safety. Um, I haven't quite made that transition over to tagging up yet. have been heavily considering it. Um, but again, you know, that's, that's just the way I like to do things. So as we're in, in the act of shooting, my teams should be getting to four spots. So phase one for us, when we talk about phase one, it's not based on seconds. It's just based on the time that the ball is in flight or as the players in the act of shooting we want to get ourselves to floor spots. So I'll give you a quick video just to give you an example of what that would look like and then come back to this. So coaches, hopefully the video isn't too choppy. Um, I've slowed it down as best I can too. So I'll give you a, a quick example of what that phase will look like. So we've just shot the ball from the top of the three-point line. Ball's now in flight. 
and we've got players moving. So we've got three on the offensive glass and a bit of offensive luck in this situation. And we're able to shoot that little short mid-range jumper. So much the same again. Penetrate, kick out, three on the glass, players getting the floor spot. So three, obviously, here on the offensive glass, a long rebounder and safety's getting back to those positions there in that situation. So hopefully that gives uh, some, some context. I think I've got one more there. I don't think I need to show you too much more. I think you've got the idea now. All right, so just just a few examples there of, of shots going up in offense and then obviously us getting to floor spots in, um, in preparation to play defense. So just with that and just with that phase one that I just spoke about, um, what, what coaches need to understand is that our offense is directly connected to our defense. And what I mean by that is for us to be a great defensive team, um, one, we need to get good shots, good uncontested shots and predictable shots. Uh, two, we can't turn the ball over. I mean, if you turn the ball over, you, you're going to be a, doesn't matter how good, how, what sort of kettle you have, you're not going to be a great defensive team. And secondly, if you uh, shoot really poor shots or unpredictable shots, you're going to be a poor defensive team. Because if you don't know where your shots are coming from and you don't know where your shots are generated from in your offense, you can't be a good defensive team. So getting great shots, gives you the best chance of being prepared and being ready to play defense. So that's phase one. As we're in the act of shooting, we get the floor spots. Phase two for us. Hey, Ken, what, sorry, yeah. can I just ask one question on the trends? They've had one come through and just thought it might be timely to ask it. Yeah, um, of course. Do you specify which players are going to the glass, which one's the, the long rebound and which one's safety, or is it, uh, is it interchangeable? What's that? Um, yeah, look, I could probably do a whole clinic on that. <laughs> that subject alone. Um, but I'll give you the, the short version and, and the coach that's asking. It's a, it's a really good question. Um, technically, three, four, five offensive glass, one or two safety and long rebound spot or nail. Um, so our long, re, re, our long rebound spot is the nail position. Those two spots are interchangeable. Now, just on that subject, there are going to be situations in the game or exceptions to the rule where perhaps that changes. As an example, one penetrates off a wing or mid pick and roll, gets two feet in the paint and shoots a little mid-range pull-up jumper or gets on the rim. Well, that's clearly going to change things because they can't then go to the long rebound spot or to the safety. Um, so that would then mean the three-man would have to roll out. Or if it was the two-man, it would be between the two and the three to get back and get the, uh, the nail on the safety. So Hopefully that answers that question for that coach. But generally speaking, it makes sense to send your biggest players, your biggest, meanest, ugliest players, best to get them on the offensive glass. Um, you know, and generally your threes, generally your best slasher and one of your better uh, athletes as an example. So um, hopefully that answers the question for that coach to ask that question. It's a really good question though. Um, which leads me into phase two. So phase two is what happens once the ball's either gone through the net, because obviously there are only two outcomes. Shot goes up, either goes through the net and it's a make, or it misses and it's a rebound situation. So from there, the spacing, and I can show coaches some diagrams of this when I get to the drilling aspect of it later on. Um, the closest player to the ball out of the four or five, whether that's an inbounds pass or a... Um, a rebound has to pressure the ball. That's that's their job. So from there, we get res specific responsibilities. So we've got, uh, you know, three, four, five on the offensive glass. One or two is, is the nail and the safety. And then from there, we get specific responsibilities based on whether the ball goes through the net or gets missed and gets rebounded. So closest player to the ball uh, out of the four on the five becomes obviously a, a, a plugger. That's after they pressure the, inbound, the, uh, the outlet or the inbounds pass. The person who's the long rebounder on the nail, it's their job to find the ball carrier on the catch. Or in most teams these days, you generally have someone who's the designated point guard. I mean, you know, for example, if I was playing, would it be, you know, well, you know, clearly 
Sarah Ellsworthy was bringing the ball up or, you know, obviously. And so Scout comes into play here with this stuff. You're going to know who generally the main ball carrier is in a team. Um, but obviously in situations where they're not, they're a point guard by committee team. Well, great. It just means your long rebound is going to have to wait for the outlet pass and then locate that player as the ball leaves the fingers of the, um, you know, the, the rebounder. So those two players in particular, your dogger and your plugger, well, their job really is, is so important because in that phase two, uh, you want to be trying to keep the ball and block it up in the back court for that eight seconds. If you can get an eight second violation in that situation, that's a, that's a huge win. Uh, but their job is to really try and create time because what's happening now is between the other two players that crash the offensive glass, their job is to pull their backsides and get back and release the safety so that way the safety can get released and cover the next pass down the sideline. Um, so they become sprinters. And, you know, we send our biggest player back to the basket and we send our other guard, who's the other sprinter, off to the weak side guard. So generally speaking, we're pretty well matched up. So I can show coaches some, um, some diagrams of that. The internet I've got is a little limited, so I don't want to share too much video as it's just going to get too choppy for you. Um, but phase two for us is about you know, specific responsibilities for players based on where you are on the floor. And I think a really important thing or mentality to have sometimes is not to be a my man, your man, you know. And, and I think, you know, I think tagging up and, and some, because I can speak of the two, uh, I think tagging up's great in that respect. There is a, a designated responsibility early and I'm certainly not uh, against either or. I mean, you know, I'm certainly sitting here arm wrestling whether I consider taking out myself at some stage, but you know, that's great. You have a designated player already. Um, this way here obviously is a bit different in terms of there are going to be times where you may have some mismatches and the way you have to deal with that is, well, well, for one, you have to find switchable opportunities somewhere throughout that shot clock and sometimes you might not so sometimes you have to deal with some mismatches um, in a situation if you are going to be a team that sends you know three to the glass or two to the glass or four to the glass or five to the glass whatever that is you are, and you play defensive transition this way you're going to have to deal with some mismatches at different times but safety effectively stays and defends the basket until they're released and what you end up doing with this is you end up covering the most dangerous player on the floor, which is always the player for the ball. And then the safety covers the next most dangerous player, which is always the player closest to the basket. And then from there, you get a plugger established. So then obviously you plug up in the middle of the floor, then everybody else essentially scrambles to find a player once released in rotation. Phase three for me is just about having, uh, it's, it's, it's simple, that's your half-court defense. So, you know, push points, pick and roll defensive coverage, defensive rotation. So phase three is pretty much everything that you would implement as a coach in the half court or quarter court. Phase one and phase two. Again, phase one's what you do as you shoot the ball or in the act of shooting or wherever the ball's in flight. Phase two is everything that happens, whether there's a make or a miss at the end of the shot. Phase three is everything else in, in the quarter court. So that's the way I'd be teaching my defense and break it down that way. Okay. Non-negotiables. Uh, coaches, really important you know, for, for everyone. These, these three subjects I'm going to cover here are non-negotiable in the program or any program I'm coaching in. And I certainly believe that if we do these three things really well, we'll give ourselves the best chance to be in the contest. Um, not, it doesn't mean it's going to be complete bulletproof, um, you know, and certainly, but these things will give you the best chance to play great defence. Not foolproof, though. So for us, uh, we, I work with this uh, acronym called SAC, S, A, and C. Uh, first for me is stance, and that's where defense starts. And that's, for me, athletic readiness. Uh, low hips, balls on my feet, um, and, you know, obviously, knees bent, low hips. Really simple, in the correct stance. Uh, you have to have athletic readiness to be a great defender. But the next part's activity. An activity for me is, is positioning in terms of arriving at the right place in the catch, whether that be in denial, whether that be into a closeout, um, whether that be as the ball shifts from one side of the floor to the other and I become an on-ball defender to an off-ball defender. So my positioning is, is incredibly important. My hand placement, uh, obviously not playing with my hands completely down, you know, maybe 
you know, elbows slightly bent, my arms and hands generally above my shoulders ready to play. I'm talking about off-ball defenders here. And then hedging and rotating when required. So making sure in the right positions in the right place at the right time is incredibly important. So that comes, that, that for me is activity. And then the last part is communication. Um, a lot of coaches with a lot of presentations, NBA level and I think Sammy Grugan from, from New South Wales, uh, talking about ELO, early, loud and often. Um, and maybe even Shannon Seabon presented on the same thing. For me, just clear and assertive talk. Uh, is incredibly important. And then using the correct terminology in our language. So I'll talk a bit about language later on. Um, but again, if, I think if you cover those three things here, we're going back to preparation. It's certainly my belief that if you can do these three things well on defense, you'll be prepared to play defense. Um, so again, just some, some visual ideas of non-negotiables coaches. So really important we have non-negotiables in our program. Okay, uh, defensive principles, sorry, defensive guidelines and principles. So first one, really important, uh, and it's king. It's containment, one-on-one -on -one containment. Want to be a great defender, got to be able to stay in front of my player. Um, you know, and if you think of an ideal world as a coach, you imagine never having to teach defensive rotations because every single player can play in front of their their player and you know we can all win the lotto at the same time you know it's not a real world but it'd be an ideal world um, that every single player can stay in front of their player so I think it's important to invest a lot of time in, in your containment and having a great understanding um, is to your push points so one-on-one -on -one containment's important I think that's key um, now the guideline and principle for us is stretching all catches um, and if you think about that without even telling you know, no matter what the offense is, you don't have to, you know, if you were never to scout a game um, and you were just to talk about stretching catches, I, I think that paints a pretty clear picture to players that, okay, well, clearly the player isn't allowed to catch the ball where they want to catch it or where the offense requires them to catch it. So um, as an example, I mean, obviously everyone's been watching The Last Dance. Uh, there are no spoilers here for anyone who hasn't. Um, with the exception of they run a triangle offense. It was a really important part of their offensive structure throughout the uh, the late 90s when Phil Jackson was coaching them. Has some very specific uh, catch points. For example, pinch post has to catch the ball at a certain point in the offense. Uh, no different to a shuffle offense. You know, A lot of offenses have very specific catch points. Well, as a team, you want to be disruptive, or we certainly want to be disruptive and not allow teams or players to catch the ball where they want to catch it. Um, Secondly, a player shouldn't be able to shoot the ball from where they catch it from. Um, so again, you know, for, for players that are great spot-up catch-and-shoot shooters, again, if you can take the shot away on all catches, whether that be on a closeout, and that's going to be most situations, whether I stretch the catch to a metre or 30 centimetres or a couple of metres away from where they're supposed to catch it from, well, that's great. It means that the players aren't going to be in a position to catch the ball and shoot it within range unless you're... Uh, I don't know, Lelani Mitchell or Kia Nurse or, you know, Christy Harrow or someone like that who, who has uh, incredible range. So, you know, that's, that's a really important job for, for, a, uh, for a player. Obviously, uh, push points, you know, um, you know, I always like this one when I work with, uh, with Guy. Um, he uses a defend the house um, analogy. Obviously, it's, it's you know, you really simple. You talk about the roof of the house and you're going to force players down the roof or up the roof and then down the walls. Really simple um, analogy, but great and, and really easy to picture as a player. And for young junior kids, for those of us who are junior coaches, I think it's a it's a great one to go by. Um, that's if you're you know, a sideline, baseline uh, team and certainly for me, I am. But if you're a, a pack team, obviously that would change things slightly for you. Another one I really like to implement with teams is applying the five defensive Ds. So on dead ball situations, um, any dead ball situations, we want to delay, delay inbounds pass, delay any outlet pass, deny anything that's one pass away, deflect it if we can deflect it. If they do catch it, we want to be disruptive. And then the last D is we want to have great defensive discipline and not foul. And I think a really good one for coaches to ask sometimes with players as well you know, as coaches and 
you know, we have a tendency, I certainly have a tendency sometimes to overcoach things and, and talk too much um, or give too much uh, feedback. But a great way to get feedback for, for players if perhaps you're not happy with things, particularly on a defensive standpoint, is ask the offense, you know, let's say you've got a five lights and five darks and you're working on a, you know, maybe just we'll say four, four and four and it's a shell drill and you're not happy with the level of um, pressure that's being applied, well, just stop the drill and ask the offensive play. Do you feel comfortable? And if they say no, well, that's a pretty clear sign to the defensive team that, uh, you know, they're not doing their job. Um, so as a defensive player, I want, I want my player to feel uncomfortable. That's, that's my job, make them feel uncomfortable, rush them, um, et cetera. So it's a great one for coaches to, to use. Uh, Obviously, uh, we want to force teams into contested shots. I spoke with it earlier on with the uh, obviously the, the statistics that we look at at the end of each game and one shot per possession. So, you know, most teams these days are forcing people into mid-range, contested mid-range jump shots or contested shots. So for us, we want to contest every single shot uh, we possibly can. So um, in an ideal world, again, every single shot gets contested. But, you know, that's an ideal world. It's not always going to happen. Um, positioning and rotating when required. Um, so I, I spoke about positioning earlier on with um, the non-negotiables. Uh, so for me, I think the first line of, of defense besides one-on-one -on -one containment is if we are beat or even if uh, the ball gets put to the floor, anytime it breaks the three-point line, you want every player in a, that's in a position to do so to stunt and hedge at the ball. And the reason why I think that's a great skill to implement and pack my defences do a lot of this is, is to give the ball handler the illusion that as I drive down the lane, or at least think I've beaten my player, um, to give the illusion that I've got players stepping up to help or take away the drive lane. Um, again, if I can create that sort of doubt in a player's mind, um, you know, perhaps they're going to pull up and it's going to give my teammate the opportunity to recover and get back in front. So anytime the ball breaks the three-point line, we have to be in a position to be able to hedge. It does mean for some time, um, for some of us that, you know, if you're in a help position already two passes away, well, that's a really easy skill to do. Uh, if you're one pass away and, you know, you're in denial, you then have to open your stance back up and then get back into denial if you're one pass away at the end of the dribble or the pickup. So, um, you know, often you have to move from a closed stance to an open stance. So, you know, I'm not a... If, if you ask me if I'm a pack coach or a pressure coach, I wouldn't say I'm one or the other. I'm, I'm both because I certainly believe there's a defense for every situation in basketball. And then the last point, I think, is you have to be adaptable and adjustable with your defense. Um, you know, obviously, I spoke about not allowing the offense to feel comfortable. That, that's your job. But I think if you're a team that junks things up regularly and you want to keep, you know, want to keep the offense guessing, um, you know, we will often have to change things up. So, you know, and I know I'm not scared to change things. If I think something's not working, uh, provided we've done it correctly to start with, um, you know, well, if that's clearly not working, well, you're going to have to go to plan B or plan C. So that does mean sometimes you have to change things. And if you're not prepared to do that and you continue to get scored on, well, you're, you're basically saying, well, I'm prepared to lose the game um, without making change. So, you know, for me, I'm happy to make adjustments and, you know, I think it's really a lot of really good coaches out there that are able to really simplify things. And for me, simplifying defense and the game is, is difficult for me because there's so much stuff I like. There's so much stuff I like and there's so much stuff I want to do. So I want to try and do it all. I want to have the best of all the worlds. And then eventually, I'm sure, at some stage, speak to me another 10 years and you might only have two bullet points for the, uh, the whole presentation. I might have changed it entirely by then. Um, but for now, this is the these are the defensive guidelines and principles that I'm working with uh, for coaches. So, Okay, so next point um, I want to talk about is well, having a defensive communication key. So I spoke earlier about being... Uh, having a language or a terminology that you use. Um, I think for, for coaches, I think it's really important that you, you have this stuff available to your players. Um, if you want them to have the greatest understanding you possibly, they possibly can have of, of defense in your system, well, I think you need to make it really clear to them. So I haven't put everything on there. I've just given you some idea. Um, but if this was the state under 16 Metro team, this is, you know, they'd have a model like this to work with. So I've just obviously used... Um, 
defensive transition, you know, half court defensive communication, pick and roll coverage and communication, half court and full court defensive scheme calls. So whether you're a team that, you know, you know whether you're man to man's one or your zones are two, or if it's, you know, one, three, one, it's 13, whatever you choose to do, you can do that. Um, for me, obviously I like to use numbers with half court schemes. Um, with pick and roll coverage, I like to use colors um, with, with pick and roll coverage. And, and then obviously you've got a, a number of other communications. So again, this isn't just, this isn't what you should do. This is just what you can do um, in your situation as, as coaches. So hopefully that just gives you some, um, some context. There's obviously a lot there and there's a lot of stuff I haven't put on the floor. Uh, sorry, I haven't put on the uh, presentation here in, uh, for this one. Okay. So building a defensive playbook. Um, Again, I think if you want to have a, a really, um, if you want to really clearly define your, your defensive schemes, your defensive rules, um, I think it's really important that you actually give your players a defensive playbook. And I always, um, certainly when I when I played, and I wasn't, you know, it was not a, not a, you know, it was just a reasonable player. I wouldn't say a good one and played rep level basketball, um, which would be the equivalent of state, you know, obviously in. Uh, in Australia here is, you know, a lot of coaches that have said they're defensive coaches and we start pre-season and we start our season and we get a playbook and we look through the playbook and what's well, all offense. Um, so I, th I think if you are going to be a defensive coach and I challenge you to actually put your defense in writing on paper and it should be part of your defensive playbook. Uh, I think it's really important. If you want them, your players to have a, an absolutely great understanding of your defense and defense, um, present it to them. And the reason why I say that is not every player is, I mean, most athletes are generally kinesthetic, which are doers or visual. And I'm, I'm predominantly the two myself. Um, but there are some read or write uh, learners out there. And then obviously the others auditory, I can hear it and I can go out and do it. Uh, just via verbal instructions. So I think you've got to try to learn to cater to the, all those learning styles as best as you can. Um, and so for me, I'll give you an example of, of, of my defensive playbook just to give you some, some context. I'm just going to create another share for a second. Hopefully this... Uh, Works for you. Perfect. Does that come up on the screen, Rose? Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, mate. So, you know, coaches, whether that's your... And look, I'm happy to share this too, coaches. This, there's no, no secrets here. It's all, just, you know, common information. Um, but, you know, defensive transition, half court defensive principles, pick and roll defense, zone defense, basically, you know, obviously, in, in, in detail here, this is pretty much everything uh, I would have coached with a, a state league team or a, a state team um, or even WNBA or win national team. So I'll cover some of this stuff in the um, – oh, sorry, I've gone another slide ahead in this uh, presentation, which I shouldn't have. Sorry, hopefully uh, – is it still on the uh, iPad? I'm just lost – yeah, we're still on the playbook, mate. Yeah, perfect. Excellent, excellent. So, coaches, I just wanted to give you an idea of what that looks like. I'm just going to quickly scroll through it. Um, again, if I wanted to do – I could do a presentation for an hour on each of these subjects, So, and I don't think we have time for that to, tonight. But just wanted to give you an idea of what a defensive playbook would look like. Um, so, hopefully, that's that's been made really clear to, uh, to everyone here. But I'm happy to share that. So – Please, coaches, anyone who wants access to it, um, please let me know, and I'm more than happy to to give to anyone. So, again, coaches, if you if you want to give your players complete clarity, um, you know, um, so again, not every player needs that. Some players are going to be able to just get through training every day and, and games, and they'll remember that stuff. But, you know, I, I think it's great for when you're on road trips or. Um, you know, for most VJBL kids, as an example, you know, they're going to sit in a car for, you know, a couple of hours if they're driving from Southern Penn to uh, you know, Bendigo uh, or, or Sunbury, as an example. It's a long time in the car. And 
or what a great way to give them focus uh, coming into a game by actually having something that you know they can they can look through and refresh themselves on. It helps create and minimise doubt uh, doubt in players' minds, um, so they again have, have more clarity. I think it's a it's a powerful tool for coaches to use. So, um, move on to the next slide. Okay, so you know. I firmly believe defense can be fun when it's a focus, um, you know, and it, and it needs to be a focus if you want to be a defensive minded team. So um, when it does become a focus and, you know, your team starts to see the results with wins um, and you can give them tangible evidence through statistics, um, you know, and your team can see that it's, it's helping you create, um, and build momentum on the offensive end, you know, defense becomes really fun. But as, as a coach, I, I think that there are a lot of great drills out there. Um, in fact, every drill can be great, but it's so important as a coach to actually have, you know, what detail you coach in these drills um, is, is uh, what conditions the athlete and, and obviously creates habits. So I think Lucas spoke about habits within his uh his presentation as well. So I, I think you have to really, really coach the details in your drills really hard. And I think secondly, well, you know, you need to have variety. I think there's nothing worse than a player. And I think there are staple drills that drills you have to go, you know, whether it be a shell drill or a Brett Brown cutthroat drill as an example. I think, you know, you've got staple drills that serve purposes. 1v0 closeouts, you know, they might just be part of your, your program. But, you know, I think you do have to have variety. And, you know, I think if you have variety with your drills, it, it eliminates a couple of things. And, and I'm sure every coach here can relate to this. That you think of a drill that you may have and how many times, you know, you get to that point of the season where players, they know the drill now and they're starting to take shortcuts. Or it's like an offense, you know, the defense starts to read and learn the offense. And, you know, well, if your players aren't smart enough to counter that, well, then obviously the defense is going to win every time. So I think it's important to have a variety of drills. Staple drills are great. You need to have them. Um, but you also have to have a variety of drills and, you know, that serve the same purpose. So create a library of drills. Um, secondly, in training sessions, we'll actually set defensive scores, you know, and I'll just say this as an example, their first team to six defensive stops. Make defense your focus. Um, you know, make defense the reward. You know, I want, I want my teams to play defense. Or if I'm on the floor, I want to be the team that's playing defense. As an example, you know, the only way to get to play defense is by scoring on offense. Um, you know, and then you stay on defense until you're scored on. Every defensive stop you get is plus one. Um, or every time you get a stop, the shot that's taken on the floor is, you know, plus whatever the floor value was of that shot. It's a three-point shot and they miss it. It's plus three for me defensively. So I think coaches, it's important to find ways to make defense the reward uh, particularly again this is all about building a defensive minded team because defense isn't again just drills it's about conditioning your mind to play it as well um, and conditioning your body to play it and the only way you do that is obviously by by having great fitness so um, i don't have that on this slide but i, I remember going away for the 2008 olympics with with mike McHugh. It's it, you know and he's another great mentor of mine as well and you know he was so big on our fitness prior to going away. The, obviously, the players' fitness, not the coaches' fitness. If you saw me in 2008, you'd think I looked like the guy that ate Kennedy um, back then. So, you know, but fitness was so important and our ability to be fit, you know, impacted our ability to play defense. So, uh, again, those, those things are really important. So defense is as much a mindset and a conditioning thing, both the mind and body, um, than just drills itself. So, and I think every coach here understands the better your your um your defense is well the better your offense is going to be it's it's really that simple so i'm going to show you a couple of drills i'm just going to go back through the um defensive drills and concepts so I'll just open that back up and take your coaches back through that we'll go, I'll go through a couple of drills and if i'm feel like i'm taking too much time i'll i'll cut it short and anyone who wants to ask questions like no one can so uh, if you just bear with me for a second Okay, hopefully we're back to the uh, the iPad. Yeah, we are, mate. Perfect, perfect. So, I'll go through some drills that are, you know, 
some pretty staple basic drills that I think are, are good for coaches at any level. And, and the one thing I do want to explain to every coach here is that um, it doesn't matter what level you coach at, you know, and, and obviously I've been really fortunate and blessed to, to work at WNBL level as an assistant coach and head coach and head coach with the tall ferns and assistant coach with the tall ferns and NBL one level. We're teaching the same things at that level that any domestic coach would or should be teaching. Uh, we're no different. You know, we work on shooting form. We work on box out drills. We work on uh, the technique of, you know, how you play denial, how you close out. Um, we're the same. So, you know, you're not going to get any magical drills here that are going to instantly make your team a, you know, a defensive juggernaut. They're, they're things that I guess you, you have to work through through time, but everything's so important. So hopefully I can go through some stuff. So look, uh, for, for coaches, you know, basic drills. I mean, we, st I start with a lot of closeout stuff and the closeouts are incredibly important. Um, you know, there are so many different ways to build them up. One on zero is a good way to start sometime, you know, uh, one, cause you can work on technique and then obviously hand placement, foot placement, whatever that may choose to be, whether you close out the inside shoulder, the outside shoulder, uh, feet outside feet, whether you like to close with a certain angle, that, that's your choice, coaches. I'm not here to teach you the exact techniques, but I just want to give you some ideas of how you can build a defensive one and team. So, you know, a good place to always start is, you know, coach with a ball at the top and, um, you know, obviously closing out and then sliding to push points. It's a good way to to start defense or if you've got obviously a large amount of numbers, you know, so I'm working off the second, um, hopefully it's working for you guys. Can you actually see any of the diagrams popping up on that race? Um, we've got the, um, the three diagrams there, the closeouts and, and that. Yeah. And if I'm drawing over top of them, are they coming up on the screen at all? Just cause I don't see it coming up. Yeah. I don't think so. No, nah, they're not. Okay. Well, I'm probably going to have to leave that one today. So, look, I mean, coaches, I won't go through. Normally, I'm able to animate on top of the, uh, the diagrams, but for now, it's not even um, scrolling when I scroll. So, just got to worry that's not actually working at all. I might have to probably skip it if it's not working recent. Yeah, that's fine, mate. I can always come back to that, coaches. Again, I'm happy to send this stuff to you, but I did want to go through some drills. But obviously, if it's not working, uh, that's going to be a problem. Um, so sorry about that, coaches. That's a that's a bit of a shame. Anyway, that's that's um that's come up there, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah okay. Look, I'm gonna. That's not wanting to cooperate today. Uh, sorry, coaches. Well, that worked really well last time. I I did this uh this one anyway. Look, so I'll, I'll skip that one for now. But obviously, drills, coaches. You you really need to um you know your drills are, are really important, but like I said, the detail and the drills are actually the most important part of it. So, um, again, you know, how you build them up from one on zero to two on zero, two on one, one on one, three on three, four on four. Um, the one drill I did want to show, which is what conditions kills, I won't be able to show you, but I can show you a game example of that. So, hopefully we're back on the, um, the share screen. So, we spoke about defensive kills as a measure of our defense um, and how you build a defensive mindset. Um, well, the, the first example, well, the only example I'm going to give you a game like is um, this is an international game against Spain. Um, it's in the build up to the 2016 Rio Olympic qualifiers. Clearly, we all know that we didn't qualify. Um, this was in Spain. For those of us who don't follow any international basketball, um, the Spanish women's team are the third um, ranked FIBA team in the world, obviously second and third only to Australia and the US. Um, they have some amazing players. I mean, in terms of their credentials, silver medal at Olympics, the last Olympics, um, silver medals and bronze medals at FIBA Worlds events and a number of gold medals at a number of uh, Euro basket events. So they are incredibly good, have probably one of the best, one of the best point guards in the world, maybe one of the best point guards to ever play in Leia Palau, um, Ruta Zage, um, who's a WNBA level player, Elba Torrens, who's considered the best European women's player. So they, are, they aren't no joke in this. They're not pushovers. And 
So we went to uh, Spain in 2015 in the build-up, and, and Chris, I was working with Chris Lucas at the time with the, with the Tall Ferns program. And, and, you know, if you want to be a great defensive team, sometimes coaches, well, you're going to have to play ugly basketball because the end score is 52-54. It's not a... Uh, it certainly wasn't a spectacle for anyone going to watch the game. And uh, a funny story is we actually finished the game afterwards and I'm walking back to the locker room and one of the members in the crowd, um, a gentleman in the crowd, started abusing me, telling me, oh, coach, your team's ugly and team plays ugly basketball and no offense, defense only, and you make the game look ugly. And I took that as a compliment. You know, I thought, well, that's great. That's exactly what I want my defense to do. I want to, I want to make the, one of the best teams in the world look ugly. Um, so it was a sort of a mission accomplished on, uh, on my part. And, of course, when I got to the change room, I started crying because uh, he really hurt my feelings. So, um, <laughs> so look, I'm just going to give you an example of, uh, of a kill. And some of it's going to be in game speed. Hopefully, it's going to cooperate. If not, I'm just going to have to pull it along. Uh, so this is their first defensive position. So remember, that's three defensive stops in a row without fouling and without giving up an offensive rebound. Now, talking through the defense here, nice little show, little deflection. The ball goes out of bounds. That should fast forward. Switch there. We switch a lot of... Well, I mean, we're not a huge team, so a lot of like to like stuff, we'd switch. Okay, now offensive rebound. Now that would obviously be a reset back to zero. We get a hand on the shot, but it's actually a shot clock violation. So shot clock violation in that situation. We get on the other end, we score two. Back into defense, double staggered and high pick and roll. We switch the like to like. Nice help and rotation. Another deflection, ball goes out of bounds. Nice little hedge, deflection. That's a forced turnover. That's slot number two. We get under there in, we make two foul shots in a row. Back into our defense. Good, our players generally have reasonably good position. Late on that switch. Late on that closeout. Arrive on the catch. Nice switch, nice trap rotation down the other end. Scramble here, scramble there, and another shot clock violation. So that's your kill. So if you were to put it in a game, then we actually go on the other end and make another two-point shot. I mean, if you if you break it down that way, now for us, we're looking to get eight of those a game. Um, so if you think about that, we in that position there, we score six points, um, and we get three stops. And if you can do that, eight times throughout a game. I mean, even if you score two points, you know, you can start to see how you can start to build momentum and obviously create separation from an opposition team. I mean, and again, you know, obviously in the first part of that clip there, I mean, there was some defensive luck. And, you know, obviously any time, you know, we come down, they come down the other end of the floor and they shoot a shot and miss and clearly get the offensive rebound and then, you know, they missed the hoop entirely. So there's only a couple of seconds left on the shot clock. You know, we got lucky in that situation. If there was a hit the ring and they had a full 14 seconds, there's every chance they score in that situation. So we had some defensive luck in that situation. But the next two portions of that kill, the next two stops, you know, to me were probably uh, as much good defensive execution. And there was some evidence of hustle plays through deflections and obviously some evidence of us playing in a stance with activity. And obviously the communication, I can't play for you because obviously there's no sound. I cut the sound out. So hopefully it gives you some context. So next part is obviously scout. So I said that would be as part of the eight step, um, eight steps to building a good defensive uh, or defensive mindset and team, you need to have a scout. So scout for me is really important, uh, whether I'll be coaching the national team, whether I'll be coaching VJBL or state league, I'm going to present the scout. Um, I've used some portions of, uh, of, of Reese's team from last year. Obviously, they were the team that won the championship um, at, at, at Big V State champ level. Um, obviously, uh, 
much better team than our team and, and did an exceptional job to win their first year in the league. But um, in terms of the actual scout and what I'm looking for, well, I'm just going to give you, you know, just a few bullet points here. Well, purpose and focus of, of our scout, why do we do it? Um, or in, and what are we looking for? Um, well, generally speaking, we'll, we'll put our, most of our focus in the starting five and, and some of their best supporting players. We're not going to scout if, if it's a team full of 12 players or, you know, a team like uh, Sam Thorne did a great job with Bolleen of having, goodness, a roster of 15, 16 players, you know, rotating a lot of the juniors through there. Um, well, you know, I'm not going to scout every single one of those players. It's not just, uh, not out of uh, lack of respect. It's just that, you know, we're going to put more of our focus into some of the, the, the key players in that team. Um, generally speaking, we'll put focus in the most frequently used sets. Um, you know, normally three to sort of five max. We wouldn't scout beyond that with the state league team. If it was, uh, you know, an Opals, for example, well, you know, it's that it can be a number of, of different sets and obviously different coaches do different things. You know, Sandy runs a lot of uh, sets and, and then, you know, Joyce used to run a lot of uh, the conceptual motion and flow type continuity stuff. So obviously, uh, you know, different coaches presented different challenges. But at state league level, three to five sort of max. Uh, most common actions, um, a zone offensive coaches have a zone offense. Um, some coaches are really good at having the same offense for man and zone. Um, baseline solo and a bounce plays, any uh, after timeout of special plays, uh, generally scout what they do or what teams do after foul shots. Um, so are they a pressing team or do they fall back to zone? And then how do they defend different actions? Um, and pick and roll for me was really important because, you know, I run a lot of pick and roll offensively. So I need to know how teams are going to defend that as to what we are going to get at the other end of the floor. Um, then generally with video, we wouldn't spend any more than sort of 10 to 20 minutes maximum. That'd be with the state team or state league team or even the national team. Um, you know, I think any more than that's just a, a mind kill. And I've certainly been through some video sessions as a player and then as a coach that have, have been rather long-winded. So I think that's that takes a lot of skill to get to that point. Um, but, you know, these days it wouldn't be any more than that 10 to 20 minutes max um, to try and keep the players focused. Um, in terms of an actual scout, on a scouting day, I mean, obviously at state league level, where we train twice a week, Tuesday nights, Thursday nights, that's it. Um, so, you know, we would normally go five on zero before we even warm up. So prior to the warm up, we'd walk through plays, we'd show whatever scout team, um, we'd bring them in, they'd go through the, you know, opposition team's offense, five on zero. Uh, we'd explain, obviously, what they're looking to get, what their main scoring options would be out of a certain set, and then would add in defense, but just go through at walking speed before training starts, before the warm-up. And then when we get to actually scrimmage, when we get to the training part of our session, we'd scrimmage that five on five at live speed. So it just gives players plenty of time to absorb that. And again, you know, the five on zero would be a sort of 10 minute time spend, absolute max um, with the five on five walkthrough, then obviously scrimmaging would spend a lot of time at training. Um, scrimmaging opposition's offense. So I spoke about having a scout team and that would, um, you know, would have a, a group of seven guys that would actually learn opposition teams' plays um, and work with my assistant coaches to then scrimmage against us at training on a Thursday night. And the reason we did that, I thought it was a great way to take away the the you know our players have then having to learn an entirely different playbook you know if we were you know if Reese was running a mid pick and roll or a horn set of some sort well we'd just say well look in this situation we're going to go to our rules or we'll go to our blue or we'll go orange um, players then didn't have to also learn the mechanics and patterns of other teams offenses they just had to know what the actions were going to be and how we're going to defend them and I thought that took away a lot of the um, you know, I guess the mental strain you can sometimes put on players. Um, so I'll just give you a, a quick, I mean, I'm giving you some a few photo snaps there, but a, um, again, a, a scout would look something like this here. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. Your opponent strengths, defensive strengths, offensive weaknesses, defensive weaknesses. Uh, we'd go into some statistics there as to what they were shooting from the floor. We'd add in, obviously, shot charts. Um, and then obviously individual players, individual stats, shot charts for that player. Andy, and then, yeah. I just got one question from a coach that would like to get a copy of this scouting report. Um, Reese, is his name Reese? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> just stole your thunder on your joke, did I? <laughs> Sorry. Um, now, you, you, your coaches, you're more than welcome. If you want a copy of some of these scouts, you're more than welcome to have them. Uh, again, there's nothing uh, nothing to hide here. It's all stuff you probably already know. So I'm more than happy to share this with anybody. Um, and sorry, Reese, I did actually tell you last time that I would share this with you. So coaches, I just do have some, uh, you know, I think some important things. Again, individual statistics, shot chart if you can add it. Are they right-handed, left-handed? Some general, you know, information. Are they an athlete? Do they have a scorer's mentality? Do they not want to score at all? Are they not a shooter? Um, you know, they shoot first on the catch or they drive first on the catch. So, you know, would add this level. And obviously, you know, out of respect, I mean, where it be, they won it. And clearly they had a, a great deep team with a lot of players that played hard and, and ran recent stuff really well where every single player got a scout there. Um, and then we're obviously going to go through all of their offensive sets. So I'm going to scroll these really quickly. I don't want to give everyone these for, for you, uh, for your sake, Reese. You'll probably do something different this year. But just want to give coaches some context. But that's the level. That's every week, coaches. That's not just when I want to or when I feel like it. That's uh, that's the level of scout my players are getting here every week. And I think it's important to do that because, um, you know, I guess if I'm coaching a state team or a state league team, I have a responsibility. These kids will want to play for the WNBL one day or they want to play for the Opals. And, you know, I have a responsibility as a coach to get these players ready to play at that level. Um, you know, obviously, just as much as wanting to build a defensive mindset, well, to do that, I need to give these players information. Now, all my scouts will have that level of information. On it. When I took away the state team, it had the same level of information on it. And... My theory with this is because coaching, I go, oh, that's a lot of information. Well, yeah, it is. And but my belief is the players that can handle that much information will absorb that much information. The players that can't, you know what? If they if, if they struggle, and my advice to them is, hey, only take in what you need to take in. You know, if you're a Ford, well, then just concentrate on that for starters. And players need to build that. that that's a skill that players build, a mental, the, the ability to you know, build a mental capacity of, offenses and opposition players and opposition schemes. That's something that players learn over time. It's not something they'll learn in, in one go. So I think as, as a coach, you have to have a pretty realistic expectation of um, your players. Now, national team, or WNBL team, uh, you better know all of it. You know, there is going to be some accountability, which I'll cover next in the uh, next part of the, the presentation. I've only got another couple slides to go, I think. Yeah. So ownership and accountability. Um, well, how's it created, coaches? Uh, how do you create a, you know ownership within your own training session? Well, let players run their own huddles and scrimmages and training. Um, that's a really simple way. Hey, um, light team, blue team, we're having a scrimmage here. Um, offensively, I want you to run this. Say defense, you guys run it yourselves. Or you know, if you have a captain or a point guard or a leadership player in each team. You know, give them some some responsibility. So, hey, look, you know, Chelsea or Sarah or whoever, you're in charge of the defense. Um, but give players ownership of it. And, you know, I, I think the other part too is even going back to scatters. Well, ask your players what they see and encourage dialogue amongst your teammates. Um, encourage feedback back to you as a coach. You know, they you, know, you want you want them to have ownership. Well, then they have to have a voice. Um, this is a really powerful one. The All Blacks, again, uh, don't, you know, I'd use the Wallabies, but, you know, they're not as good as the All Blacks. Um, but get players to present portions of scout or video and, on, on players they may defend. So this is a big one. I'm, I'm more than happy to hand, hand it over to players and say, hey, why don't you present on these players who you're going to be defending to the team? And they're more than happy to do that. And of course, that takes time to build that that level of uh, comfortability where players have the courage or the, you know, the, the confidence to go up and present in front of their teammates. But I know the All Blacks, for example, they, they utilise that a lot. Um, you know, or leaders, as I've said, get them to step up and, and take parts of video session, whether that's feedback on yourself or feedback on, on opposition. Um, and I think a really important one, and, and, and Chris was always great for this when I worked with, with Chris Lucas with... Um, when he was working with me for the New Zealand program is, you know, create an environment where your bench celebrates defensive effort and they drive the kills. Um, he was always really big on, well, your players have to have ownership of it. And, you know, you wouldn't see in the videos that I've obviously put together there, but 
um, at state league level, it's the bench that are telling you, hey, one more for a kill, one more for a kill. They're the ones communicating it and driving it from the sideline. Um, and same in training, you know, you'll hear that as well. We're, we're obviously driving kills, driving deflections. These are things that the players will take uh, responsibility for, which, which is excellent. And I guess another part, I stole this from Jeff Jansen in terms of accountability, is, you know, he has uh, uh, four levels of accountability. And, and I love this one. And I only really picked this up, uh, you know, three, four months ago, reading through some of this stuff. Um, but his four levels of accountability are, as a player, I, I need to have self-accountability first. That should always be the first stop in, in accountability is, hey, my bad, or, you know, and not that you ever want to be the my bad player in training sessions. There's nothing more frustrating than being the my bad guy constantly. But, you know, acknowledging that you made a mistake um, and being able to own up for it, have the courage to own up for it. Um, you know, I think the next stage or next level in accountability is, well, your teammates being able to hold you accountable. Um, you know, if, if someone doesn't do something, can not not a, hey, you should have done this, or, um, you know, I think there's always a way that you can tell someone your tone and the way you say it is so much more important than the actual message itself sometimes, particularly when you're dealing with, uh, with, with coaching. Um, you know, well, hey, trust me, men are just as sensitive. I've worked with plenty of men before too, but, you know, I think you just got to be very careful how you give your message. And then the, I think the next level is your captain's address, you know. I think captains should have the... You know, not, I don't want to say the power, but they should have the, the the confidence to be able to stop a train and pull everybody in and tell everybody, you know, what they should be doing and what their responsibilities are. And, you know, I've always very, have always been very, very big on, hey, well, you know, captain, that's your job. You know, and then the last point of the uh, accountability is, well, then the coach. And if it gets to that point where the coach has to address it, well, then we have we have some problems. You know, because again, we want players driving everything as much as much as we possibly can. But you know, I think that's a really good one for coaches to try and take away is well, what's the what are the levels of accountability in your program, and is it always getting to the point where the coach has to address everything? Um, and if it is, well, then you probably know that you know your players don't have as much ownership and accountability as perhaps they should have. Um, you know, so I, I would really challenge coaches to consider that at all levels, um, or at least challenge your, your players to drive the sessions you know i always say that a team or any team i'm working with that players should create the energy you know, they should be the the dominant voice at training sessions you know and, and coaches chip in where they need to um and i've got here obviously some last bullet point so i'm just reading through this one coach stuff we can rotate oh yeah well um last point of accountability is, is simple well as a coach i'm all my all my matchups, all my changeups, and all my subs are based on, you know, your ability to defend. If you can't defend the person I'm subbing you out for, you can't defend that person that you're subbing, um, going to be rotated onto. Well, and you're probably going to be sitting on the bench watching the game, you know. So when I talk about having, you know, accountability, you know, well, my players know that that's pretty clear cut from the beginning of the season. You know, we're a defensive team. And if I don't think or I don't trust that you can defend the person that you're going to be required to defend, you're probably going to be sitting on the bench a whole lot. Um, and, you know, I think for me, well, I've been really lucky because our captain of the team at, at Sunbury is an example. And I've just used this team, you know, the Sunbury team as the example in this presentation. Well, you know, defensive player of the year three times in a row. Um, you know, so... You know, we, we obviously celebrate that and, and as a club, incredibly incredibly proud of that. Um, but it always helps when you've got someone in the team that, that can drive that for you or you have a, you know, I still think to this day, I mean, if I had to pick a number one point guard, in my opinion, in Australia or in, in anything, with the WNBA, I'm picking Chrissy Harrell because I'm a, I was a witness to watching how well she could lead her team um, in huddle situations, and Bernie's a great coach, um, a fantastic coach, and a, and a, and a legend. Um, but gosh, I wish I had Christy on, on the floor to run my team and tell people where they need to go. So I think every team needs a player like that. Obviously, in the, in the state at state league level, we had Chelsea that was great. She would lead our team, and you know, obviously, you know, keep our troops accountable with the defensive side and drive a lot of that. Whenever we needed a big defensive play, you know, you could guarantee that. 
you know, she was going to come up with that for us. So, um, so and crew we like you. So, you know, talking about ownership and, and accountability, I think those things become really important. So that's the, uh, thank you. That's, that's the end of my, uh, my presentation, obviously more than happy to field questions. Sorry. The, uh, the iPad didn't quite work the way I would have liked it to today. Cause, uh, it's been really good for me in the past. I've been able to diagram a lot of stuff. So a bit disappointed. It's just uh, the internet's not quite where it needs to be at the moment. No, it was, uh, it's still really good, Kennedy, and a, and a lot of information, obviously, for the coaches to take in anyway. So um, I'll start with, I've got four questions, unless anything else pops up um, that you, you sort of didn't already cover off on. So um, I'll ask the same, I sort of put to Lucas, um, what do you see yourself as a coach more offensively or defensively focused? Um, and then how do you see that working in coaching? And I mean, I remember Brett Brown sort of spoke about you guys sort of pick one or the other and then and live with that. What do you sort of see that, that balance like as a coach and coach educator? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm probably more of a defensive coach than an offensive coach, but I, have a, a really deep respect and understanding that both of those things are completely tied to one another. So, you know, for me, it's, uh, it's not a matter of, I mean, I, I'd like to say both, but then, you know, if I really thought about as a coach, what I'm driving at training sessions and where I gravitate most towards it is defense. Um, but I love both just as much as the other. And I definitely love offense. I love teaching offense. Um, as well so yeah it's it's a tough one but yeah if I had to pick one you forcing me not saying Kennedy you're not allowed to sit on the fence today I'm going to pick defense yeah but clearly you got that balance there and we saw um you know some of the offensive concepts at the start of this series when you presented on the um the pick and roll sequences and the detail there so um yeah you're probably more well-rounded or certainly taking that approach where you want to be good on both ends of the ball um when you do the scouting, I uh, had a coach ask, do you, do you do predominantly a lot of that as the head coach or do you delegate a lot of that to your assistant coaches? How would you recommend uh, yeah. coaches go about that? Yeah, look, I, I would certainly say please please delegate as much as you can because I think it's if you're working with assistant coaches, it's, it's great for their development. Um, and look, every year is a different circumstance for me because, um, you know, last year I was the... I mean, I work in basketball full time. It's easy for me to spend an hour of my day watching some game tape and jotting some things down on fast or during my lunch break. Um, you know, it, it's and anyone who works in basketball knows that it's a you know five in the morning to eight job, and then it's a five in the afternoon to ten p.m. job, and you've got a lot of time in between. So, but not everyone I work with has that time or that luxury. Um, so I've had situations where I've been able to delegate that work to my assistant coaches. Sometimes I'll give one coach um, all the offensive sets. I'll give one coach all the individual scout. Um, then I'll oversee it on a Wednesday night before we, we hand it out to players. Um, and then sometimes I've had to do it all myself. Um, certainly at WNBL level, I've had to do it all myself. At national level, um, you know, us coaches will split it up prior to going away on a tournament and... Um, you know, by the end of obviously um, the week, you know, would go and live scout games. So I think it's different, you know, coaches. I think if you can give yourself just on the scouting, you know, because I, again, I could present a whole clinic on scouting, but I think it's a really good skill as a coach to go away and learn how to live scout as much as it is to actually watch scout from video because um, sometimes you will not, as a coach, if you ever coach a state team or a, a national team, if you're fortunate enough, you might not actually have time to watch game tape. You might actually have to go live scout and, you know, you know as well as anyone, Reese, the, the the amount of pressure you put on yourself to go on live scout and have something prepared for the next day for your athletes is is tough. You know, and that could be a three, four in the morning finish up with a couple hours sleep. It's it's difficult. So I challenge coaches to do a bit of everything if you can, and and, and it takes time to build the, the skill to do it too. It's certainly not a uh, an easy task. No, for sure. I think definitely the more you can use, like in my experience, the more you can use those assistant coaches. I've been very lucky, um, the, the two nationals I coached at. Hopefully get a third if we get this one up, like you mentioned, Kennedy. Uh, but um, certainly my assistant coach, Jess, she did a lot of the video. Uh, Lloyd did a lot of the uh, statistical stuff. And then we compiled it together. I think um, it'd be pretty tough to do on your own at those things. I think, um, you know, you've got to be willing to delegate. So, and Big V's the same. I mean, I've had, you know, a great assistant coach that's done a lot of that. So, um, very similar approach. I think it's definitely important. Um, 
had one from a coach. Um, I think I know the answer already, but I want to put it to you. Man or zone defense, um, what do you see your sort of approach and then why? Um, yeah. 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 No, I'm predominantly man. Um, and, and again, I guess the, 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 the better my man defense is, well, the better my zone defense is going to be. Um, and, and, and for also, I guess the other portion is, I think, in my opinion, man is so much more accountability. And there's so much more clarity in rotation. Zone can often create a lot of confusion with, you know, a lot of grey areas, seams, how you defend certain situations. Um, with man to man, I think you can be so much more clearer yep. with uh, with your rules and responsibilities. And in saying that, I mean, I I certainly again love teaching zone. I think uh, if if uh, and I have one zone defense that. I teach, and it's it's a zone that can be played full court and extend completely full court, but it also can be played half court, and it can be played in the quarter court. And uh, you know, and that's something that I stole from a guy. If you ever get the opportunity, coaches is a coach called Matic Veselin. Uh, he's a Serbian coach, runs an amazing um, amoeba shift zone defense, which is a, it's a two three zone defense effectively. Um, it's it's brilliant. But again, man to man for me is 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 the uh, is the way to go. And, and obviously, I think Australia do a great job of teaching that through juniors and eliminating zone to the to the point where they only, you know, can't play it until they're under 16 level. I think it's just the right way to go. And I know that uh, the, you know, this is a world away, but in India right now, I know the national coach there is struggling to actually get the Barcelona India Federation to change their mindset and not allowing any juniors beyond, you know, under 16s to play. Um, zone at all, so you know we're we're we're, we're pretty lucky here in Australia. We've got a, a, a battle that we're already winning um, just by having that mindset. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, two more, mate. Uh, pretty quick ones. Um, in your practice session, where do you sort of put your your defensive goals and focus in? Is it sort of at the start? Is it the end? At the middle? Where do you sort of yeah. um, drip in those defensive? Um, I really. Really good question. Um, again, and apologies for not being able to show the drills, coaches. Um, and I would have explained that so while doing that. Um, so for me, at the beginning, uh, a little bit at all different times. But you know, I mean, we could do one on zero closeouts, two on zero, three on zero closeouts as part of the warm up because mm-hmm. um, obviously it's dynamic. Uh, once you've done all your stretches and whatever you need to do, and your dynamic warm up, you can go straight into your closeouts and work on technique. Um, but yeah, defense can be at any time for me. Um, go straight on one-on-one, going to wall ups, one v one v one wall ups at the front of the rim or from the low block, uh, and then obviously build it. But generally speaking, just so to give um, even more context to that, a session for me would obviously be like most coaches a warm up of some sort, um, then work on skill work, and, and skill work isn't just associated with offense. You know, one on zero finishing or lap drills that could be closeouts and, and, and technical aspects of your defense. Um, so, you know, a third of my session will be skills, offense and defensive. Uh, the next third of my session will be breakdowns, you know, 2v2, 3v3, 4v4, uh, decision-making. And then the next third of my session would be uh, scrimmaging. So, you know, try to cover everything we possibly can. And then, you know, if we've had a really bad week and we, we stunk it up, like, I mean, when we played you round three, Last season, you guys were like seven for seven from the three-point line. Well, clearly, we were working on closeouts and <laughs> for the first part of that, you know, the majority of that session. So, that's going to change for every coach based on, you know, the week you may have had prior. Um, yeah. That was all to make those uh, three-point shots. So, I'll take credit for that. Um, definitely not. I have good players. We all know. So, um, last one. How much, um, you know, so you went through a lot of detail. You've coached. You know, uh, really high level WNBL, tall firms, um, you know, really great big V team over the last few years. How, when you go back to VJBL, because you coach a lot of VJBL yourself, but also just helping other coaches, how much do you simplify that down? Or do you just again go on that approach of I'll give them as much as possible and then just see what they can take? Yeah, no, I really like that question because I didn't answer that in the, uh, you know, I probably would have, would have covered that. If, um... So for me as a coach, um... Look, in, in, if we said VJBL, VJBL was the absolute lowest, uh, I'm not going to say lowest, but that was the, the, you know, the baseline for where I'm coaching right now. Everything else obviously would be a, a level slightly above that. Um, you know, I have no, uh, you know, every, every player we're, we're coaching 
at VJBL level, if they're in your 12 sevens team, I can tell you right now, they watch the NBL, they watch the Boomers play, they watch the Apples play. They all want to play for Australia. They all want to play in the NBL. I'm going to coach every kid like they're a national team player. They're in a national team program. I don't think the level you coach at should diminish the um, the amount of detail that you can go into. Now, obviously, if it's beyond their learning capacity, clearly you have to water that down. But I, I'd like to, for me, I'm going to go at them with as much as I possibly can. And then I'm going to gauge where they're at. You know, if they start looking blank faced and smoke's coming out of the ears, I'm going, okay, well, that's clearly too much for these kids. I need to wind it back. Um, you know, so that would be the answer. And then for those kids who perhaps are a little more advanced, well, perhaps that's an opportunity for you as a coach to then spend more time with them individually to advance them, um, you know, or perhaps if they're not as, not as skilled, perhaps that's another opportunity for you to also spend time with them and advance them and bring them further ahead as well. So I think as a coach, you know, at all levels, um, and I spoke about this the other night on another Zoom session, you just, coaches are, if there's one thing I could tell you, besides all the information I've already given you tonight, is you just got, you have to understand the importance you play. You probably don't understand how important you are in these kids' lives at any level. You know, they, you just don't understand the impact you're having on these kids in a good way. In a, and I'm assuming, you know, we're all having a great impact on these kids. Please say anything you can give them. They're going to hold on to everything you tell them. Um, you know, you're a role model. You, your job's to inspire them. Your job's to teach them um, and show them the way. Um, and, and, you know, for me, so I'm going slightly off tangent now, but, you know, as a coach, don't measure your success by wins and losses. You know, I know I've just showed you a bunch of, I mean, won some championships and national titles with, with the state team, but that's not how I measure. I don't look in, you know, not that I like to look in the mirror too much, but I look in the mirror and go, oh, I'm a good coach because I won some championships. The way I'm measuring my ability to coach is, well, you know, if I can create some players that go on to play for a national team, well, that's great. Well, there's one tick. Um, the next one is if I'm walking down the street in 10 years' time and I see the same kid again, they say hi to me. Well, you know, I've won. You know, I've, I've done a good job because they still want to have a relationship with me as a coach. Um, if I see them succeed in life, that's another tick. And the other one is, well, if they're still involved in basketball, in, in, you know, because not every player is going to play in the WNBL and every player is going to play state league. But you know what? If they become administrators, referees, coaches, or they're still involved in the game in some way, you know, broadcasters, whatever that is, you've clearly done something right as a coach because you've instilled some passion in there. You know, you've, you've given them some passion about the game. They love the game and they've stayed involved. So, you know, obviously the defensive stuff's great for coaches who are wanting to get into that and build a philosophy. Uh, but you know, please don't measure your ability to coach based on championships and winning because I, I can tell you right now, it's the bottom of the list for me. Uh, those other four factors are so much more important as a coach. So sorry we're not tangent there a little for your no, rest. But. No, it's good, mate. It's all good. It's good stuff for people to hear. Um, there has been one more pop in. I think I'll just put it to you. It should be a quick one. Yeah. Uh, um, closeouts, do you teach one hand or two hands up? Yeah, great question. Um so for me, it's one hand, and I know Shannon got asked the same question, and his answer is exactly my answer too. Um, so it's always going to be, if I'm closing out, it's always going to be the hand closest to the split line, um, irrespective of the left-handed, right-handed shooter. And the reason being is, if you've been, if you've been on a boxer at the moment, um, there's a big topic on Mike Tyson coming out of retirement for an exhibition match. Well, if you're a boxer, you generally know that if you punch, will automatically the foot that you or the hand you punch with the other foot leads forward so it's going to be the same situation if I close out with my hand close to the sideline or baseline you know my left foot's going to follow I'm going to give up the middle of the floor so for me as a you know a sideline baseline push point coach um, my preference is obviously the the hand closest to the sideline but if you want to carry two that's also okay and take away your space over either shoulder so two hands is fine I'll teach two hands but if they only want to carry one hand it has to be the hand Closest to the split line. Yeah, no, perfect. Thanks so much, Kennedy. That was um, brilliant. And we know the detail you go to as a coach and you've shown that in both the sessions you've done um, for the coaches. So I uh, can't thank you enough for that. Um, yeah, thanks again for coming on and, and giving up your time. No, thank you very much for having me. And obviously, thank you very much for putting this on for the coaches. And hopefully we're back on the court real soon, everybody. No, no worries. Um, coaches, I'll just flag uh, next week. Um, 
if I can get to the right one, that we're lucky enough to have uh, Alma Cautry and Jack Fleming. Uh, Sean, our marketing guy, clearly is losing the plot a little bit in, uh, in isolation. He's come up with uh, the mask from The Apprentice as the, uh, with Yoda and uh, Luke Skywalker there. So um, Al's going to present on, on the importance of mentoring coaches. I think um, we can all get a lot out of that, not just directors of coaching, um, like Kennedy, myself and Lucas, but certainly... Um, just coaches like yourselves that are invested in the game that can help other coaches at domestic level um, and at any level. So that's going to be great to hear from Al, who's had experience with um, Australian junior teams, um, obviously at a really high level in New Zealand, um, co coaching the NBL there um, and in Australia. So it'd be great to hear from an experienced coach in you know, Al McCautry. Uh, and then a young up-and-coming coach in Jack Fleming. Um, anyone that follows Jack's blogs, um, knows how um, talent are using the coach education space and he's going to present on uh, a need-centred approach um, to coaching. So it's going to be an interesting topic and great to learn from from Jack and Al. And um, I'll make sure I give lots of positive feedback to Sean, our, our marketing guy, about his um, great graphic that he's done up. So thanks, coaches. Um, thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you later.